right, Madam Clerk. This is to inform the general public that this meeting is being held in compliance with Section 5 of the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975. The annual notice was emailed to the Star Ledger and filed in the Township Clerk's Office on November 24, 2021, and published in the West Orange Chronicle on December 2, 2021. Councilwoman Casalino? Present. Councilwoman Matute Brown? Present. Councilman Rutherford? Here. Councilwoman Williams? Present. Council President McCartney? Present. Will everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. The council is now in their public meeting. Good e <clears throat> excuse me. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our o October twenty fifth town council meeting. We are going to start with public comment, and uh, Mr. Fagan. Thank you, Council President. Um, this evening, I would like to, uh, I'm pleased to report that uh, an update on exit seven, uh, I seen them removing the Jersey barriers the other day, so I knew something was up. Uh, and exit seven, which has been closed at Pleasant Valley Way, I believe since August, perhaps even longer, is now open. Uh, West Orange residents, uh, or anyone for that matter, can use it. Uh, as normal, all the repairs have been made. Um, it's hard to believe that it's 10 years removed from Super, uh, Superstorm Sandy uh, when it made landfall in New Jersey, and it certainly affected West Orange here. The, um, the, uh, the statistics are staggering uh, looking back 10 years, and the reason I bring this up is because we have been notified uh, from PSE&G about uh, updates to their infrastructure uh, so that if another superstorm should occur, that they are better prepared. They can't guarantee that there won't be any outages, but uh, West Orange residents should be aware that uh, the utility company is better prepared. Uh, and there was a lot of lessons to be learned uh, 10 years ago when Superstorm Super Storm Sandy hit. Uh, I'd like to bring your attention to this aerial view of Crystal Lake. Um, uh, of course, this was done with the West Orange Police helicopter. And uh, just for um, uh, orientation purposes, uh, OzPAC is located here. And I want to bring your attention to an Eagle Scout project that has uh, occurred here. Um, and Harold Ross Jr. has built these four benches and this kiosk here in this area just outside, uh, just above OzPAC. And, and it was an Eagle Scout project. And of course, you could see Harold Ross there <laughs> on the uh, right. It uh, was a year, in the, uh, a year and a half in the making, you might say. And uh, the focal point is going to be this kiosk here. Um, and it sits right on the brim of Crystal Lake overlooking with the benches. It's uh, a great spot to just sit and reflect. And what's going to happen is a um, showcase, a display case, I should say, is going to go in into that kiosk. And it will allow me to display various items of uh, Crystal Lake memorabilia and history. Of course, it's not to scale here, so many more items will fit in there. Uh, I also like to uh, point out that uh, this past week, uh, thanks to a grant by TD Bank uh, in, uh, with the Arbor Day Foundation, that there were 35 trees, seven species, planted on High Street here in the Wachong Heights. And uh, this was done with 21 TD Bank volunteers. Um, and it's worth noting that the volunteers uh, came from throughout the state. And uh, Council President was on hand to thank the uh, volunteers. And as I mentioned, they came from across the state. Uh, from uh, across the state and they provided the... Uh, the uh, manpower, if you will, uh, while Serbo's uh, nursery uh, had the equipment and the tools and the trees and uh, actually dug the holes for the plantings. Uh, our recreation director, uh, Bill Keogh, has asked me to remind everyone about the Halloween carnival coming up Saturday, October 29th at Colgate Field. There's uh, a, a lot of great things, cost, uh, costume contests, uh, rides, um, 
Uh, and this is all on our website. And it's, uh, it's going to be a fun day. Hopefully, the weather will hold out. Um, you may have heard that there's an election coming up. And this is on our website. Uh, and uh, there are poll workers needed. Uh, you can go to westorange.org. And uh, I believe this is a paid position. So if you have the time, uh, you can go to our website. And uh, the application is there. You can uh, sign up. And uh, of course, uh, we have Veterans Day coming up on November 11th. All municipal offices will be closed. We will have uh, our annual Memorial Day, uh, I'm sorry, our Veterans Day ceremony at Veterans Park at 60 Main Street here. It's in front of Town Hall, actually. Um, and it will be uh, Mayor Robert Parisi's last uh, Veterans Day um, for the Township of West Orange. And I also might add that Pete Longo uh, will be celebrating his 100th anniversary on November 2nd. Now, many of you might recognize Pete, but just not know his name. Uh, he actually moved to West Orange after World War II, July 30th, 1955, to be exact. And he is a West Orange resident, and he served, he served as a tank commander during uh, World War II. And he is uh, recognized as West Orange's oldest living veteran, certainly uh, World War II. Uh, finally, uh, Council President, I'd like to pivot uh, back to a uh, slide that I inadvertently neglected to include in my last presentation. And uh, we had an in-depth conversation with Mariam Cortez, who is the lead uh, co-responder for uh, uh, Medical Health Association of Essex and Morris. And, and she, she made a point to say that it's the first in New Jersey to do a co-response model. And uh, the review of the, uh, the uh, after-action body cam is a really uh, key, important uh, ingredient component to this. And it links people to resources, and it reduces repeated calls. And the whole uh, focal point of the program is to de-escalate any situation. And it's also worth noting that in December 2021, the program received an award from the New Jersey State General's Office for an outstanding police partnership. And that's what truly makes this program a model program and makes it special here in West Orange. And as I say, I wanted to include this in my uh, last presentation to council, uh, before the council, uh, but it got omitted, and I regret that. Um, finally, uh, just a, a quick reminder, the, um, uh, the 9 o'clock PM uh, routine is to take your keys, remove your valuables, lock your vehicles. And the other thing is, if if you need help with drugs or alcohol, uh, you can contact our West Orange Police Department, and they will uh, put you in touch uh, with the uh, uh, appropriate people to uh, receive, um, re receive help and treatment. Um, that concludes my report for this evening. Uh, this is my contact information. Anyone can contact me about anything they saw here. And uh, I might add that there are uh, several jobs available in the township, and they're all available on our website at westorange.org. Uh, thank you very much, Council President. That concludes my report for this evening. Thank you, Mr. Fagan. Any other comments from the public? Oh, yes, please. Just your name and address. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, my name is Meryl Dorf. I'm at four. I think we need to use both push yeah. both microphones together. Oh, both microphones. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Meryl Dorf. I live at four Hepworth Court in West Orange. Four what? I'm sorry. Hepworth Court. Hepworth. Thank you. Is yeah. The, I'm so sorry. Is the other mic better? It's just hard. It's not even on. It's it, not on. The, here. There's the a red the there. Yeah. So I put. Thank you, Mr. I'll use this. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Much better. As I said, my name is Meryl Dorf. It's actually Dr. Meryl Dorf. I've never spoken at a town council meeting, and I've never even been. Welcome. To... Welcome. What's that? I said welcome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've uh, never even attended one. I'm here today to advocate for a West Orange Senior Center, and I want to thank Susan Scarpa for uh, inviting me to the meeting, for the opportunity to speak on this topic that's so near and dear to me personally and so vital to our community. 
I believe this deeply. My mom just passed away in April here at Arden Courts in West Orange. She lived to the ripe age of 99 and a half. Let me tell you what I think is the secret to her long life. My folks had a wonderful community of lifelong friends from high school who lived near to each other for as long as they could. She could afford to dine at any restaurant in Manhattan, but most days my mother would rather go to different senior centers to lunch for two bucks with her old friends and the new ones who she met there. She'd enjoy the events, trips, and the camaraderie of her peers. They remained active and involved with each other's lives. These dear girlfriends all lived into their 90s. One friend is still kicking at 101 years of age. <laughs> they looked after each other. They had each other's back. West Orange, it's my town. I live and I also work here in my own office. I've been a psychologist for over 30 years. I'm also director of the Center for Psychotherapy and Psychoanalysis of New Jersey. It's a psychoanalytic training institute. I'm a therapist. I am a teacher of therapists. And I'm a therapist to therapists. So I'm kind of an expert in human interaction and relationships. I've worked in many settings with a variety of populations, including nursing homes, rehab facilities, and assisted living facilities here in New Jersey. Get to the next page. <laughs> I'm familiar with the profound importance of attachment, emotional connection, and social interaction for all people. Without it, our cognitive abilities suffer, our physical health declines, and our emotional well-being is compromised. In other words, we're all hardwired for connection. When it's not sufficient, we can't flourish. We get depressed and we wither away. So as we age, our mobility decreases, income often drops, and many are confined to their own neighborhoods or even their own homes. For a healthy senior staying home to care for a partner who's ailing is often common. It can lead to debilitating sense of isolation. And we all know solitary confinement, it's, it's a form of torture. Right? Um, so depression is one consequence. But even the prevalence of suicide is elevated in the, el in the elderly. West Orange deserves a senior center. As it was for my own mom, recreation and having a place to drop in, a place where there'll be friendly faces, a place to just be with others, when living alone is essential to meet our need for connection. It's the essence of human life. We feel tethered and secure when a friend calls to say, hey, it's just a hello. Um, I haven't seen you in a couple days. You OK? So our seniors need a town senior center. Senior centers can also provide community opportunities where older adults can connect with school children for company and growth. And the students can perform music, dance, or plays to an eager, appreciative audience. It's a win-win situation. The seniors get time with young people to give back wisdom and love, and for children and youth to develop compassion, respect, and understanding of the elderly. That builds connection and community. West Orange is really overdue for a senior center. And finally, having just turned 68 myself, as I walk around the lake, I eye the senior center at Verona Park with envy. I drive by the Livingston Senior Center with greater interest. I'd prefer not to go to another town, but rather to frequent and support a center in my own town of West Orange with neighbors. When I get to that point of life, and it's not really that far away, <laughs> West Orange deserves to do it right, creating a senior advisory board to carefully consider all aspects of the plan will help us meet our needs now and for the future. Please give this important matter serious consideration. It can become a center for wellness and life. It will keep our residents here, if they want, at home to age in place. All of us in West Orange will benefit from a senior center. It's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. All right, welcome. Okay, welcome, Susan Scarpa, 343 Gregory Avenue. 
I felt it was extremely important to bring medical professionals to speak with you this evening because our message on October 11th was not fully understood, evidenced by the responses we got. You seem to have missed the point. Our, sure. This good? Our seniors deserve, need more than structured activities. They need a home away from home to socialize, to make friends, to have intimate human contact, to talk with one another on a daily basis, to avoid loneliness and depression. That's why senior citizen centers exist in every other township. I hope you better understand that this very real and serious problem is in our township after listening to Dr. Dorff. I'm always teaching my son and my students that the first step to solving a problem is admitting that there is one. We have heard that the needs of our seniors are not being met without a senior citizen center here in our town. To convey the urgency of this problem, more clearly I've gathered a social worker, a nurse, and a doctor who will speak to you on Zoom, as well as seniors who knew Toby Katz and want to tell you about her vision for that center how she held dances there, how she made matches there, and how she loved all those seniors that she advocated for. I hope all who speak tonight will help you better acknowledge the sense of urgency for a senior center and recognize that our seniors are organized around this issue and will not go away. Our seniors who have watched the video of the last town council meeting as well as those who attended and spoke for the first time, felt their concerns were dismissed. Our seniors will continue to be here in person. Those who can't make it will be watching on TV or they will be commenting on Zoom. Our seniors feel strongly about this issue and are willing to come each week until their voices are heard. Our seniors believe that West Orange seniors and families deserve the same level of community services enjoyed by other townships in our county. I want to read to you the mission statement of Livingston Senior Department. The Department of Senior Youth and Leisure Services of the Township of Livingston comprised of programming and services that encompasses all community citizens, provides integrated and comprehensive services that promote the welfare of the community, it's okay, the welfare of the community, the development of youth, the support for seniors, and the strengthening of families. I'd like to see us adopt that kind of philosophy here in West Orange. I propose we immediately form a working group to determine the feasibility of turning the Toby Katz Center into an intergenerational community center for seniors and for families. I am volunteering to sit on this committee and suggest Michelle Casolino, Laura Van Dyke, our rec department, Rosary Morelli, and any other administration officials that you deem appropriate join us. Please show those who have come here to speak with you that they have not come here in vain. And I ask each council member to explicitly answer our three questions. One, will you immediately support a senior citizen center, a formulation of a working group to explore the feasibility of making the Toby Katz Center an intergenerational community center for seniors and families? The budget is no excuse. I can fundraise the minimal amount of money needed for this effort, and I've already approached some people. Senior services now have our three staff members. Michelle told us that last week. So number two, do you support a senior citizen advisory board? Yes or no? And if so, will, when will you write the ordinance for it? And three, as public officials with a fiduciary responsibility to our seniors, do you agree it is unconscionable that our township is the only town in Essex County that does not have a senior center? Our seniors are watching. They deserve direct answer to their concerns. And I very much appreciate your thoughtful response. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, yes. Welcome. Hi, my name is Sheila Lefkowitz, and I live on Pleasant Valley Way in West Orange, New Jersey. I've lived in West Orange for 20 years, and I love this town because it's a community with a rich diversity of persons with talent, skills, and culture that they readily share in times of need. So many of my neighbors and friends and community, religious, business, and professional leaders regularly and selflessly offer their personal help in times of crisis without seeking personal recognition or monetary compensation. West Orange folk go beyond their required roles with work and with family to care for the needs of those in our community. For sure, we are West Orange strong. The pandemic made a mega crisis, and this especially impacted our most vulnerable citizens in West Orange. Tonight, I am going to speak about how the pandemic affected our town seniors and what I think we can do to help our seniors recover and thrive. During the pandemic in June 2022, I turned 60. Some people would already classify me as a senior or a rising senior at minimum. So I'm beginning to have a senior experience. As a private citizen and a dialysis social worker for some 37 years, I've witnessed the illnesses and deaths of many senior patients and family members and friends during the pandemic. I am aware of and have been called upon to assist many seniors who are struggling due to food insecurity, housing insecurity, depression and anxiety, isolation and lack of medical screening and medical care. I'm asking the council today to begin the process of forming a senior council to address the critical needs of West Orange seniors and starting a senior center at the Toby Katz Center in Degnan Park. I'm requesting that a senior advisory committee be formed and that a senior center lo located at the Toby Katz building be created and funded. A senior advisory committee has existed in West Orange we need to bring the Senior Advisory Committee back as there are many gaps in critical services to seniors that were created by the circumstances during the pandemic. There are ways that we can plan to meet the needs of seniors in a more efficient and meaningful way now that we have learned from our responses to the COVID-19 crisis. By examining our experiences and response to the pandemic, what worked and what did not work, our Senior Advisory Committee can make recommendations about improving vital services such as safety, food, healthcare, socialization, and risk communication. We can put these recommendations into real plans for new and improved services and programs to better the lives of our seniors. Now that the pandemic is no longer a crisis, we need to bring activities and education to seniors who have suffered from medical and psychological, psychosocial problems, as well as continuing supply chain issues and shortages and a sinking economy that put our seniors at risk. There are people in our town who are still isolated and in need of critical information and assistance to access medical care and other vital services. A new senior center at the Toby Katz Center can begin with some modest funding from our business community and fundraising and grants. We already have a site in the Toby Katz Center that I think is currently underutilized. A senior center at the Toby Katz site can bring new lives to our seniors by 
providing lunches with high quality food in, in the center as well as a grab and go option. Entertainment, including comedy and music, movies and bingo, exercise, information and referral, transportation, medical screening, guest speakers, arts and crafts, gardening, technology assistance and classes for help with computers, Your phones, up. television, personal. I, I'm just asking for one Please more minute. Yeah, Thank course. you very much. Technology assistance and classes for help with computers, phone, television, personal emergency response systems with options for persons who are deaf or hard of hearing and blindness or other vision impairments, discussion groups to address the losses that were faced during the pandemic, and strategies for re-engagement, intergenerational participation. After public comment, I am asking each council member to pledge support and leadership for a senior advisory committee and begin the process of forming a senior center at the site of the Toby Katz Center in Degnan Park. As a social worker and longtime West Orange resident, okay. I would be honored to serve on this committee. I want to thank you for the opportunities to speak at this meeting, and I wish everyone a enjoyable full season. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to remind everybody that public comment is five minutes. We have a very, very full agenda this evening, and we'd like to get to the public business so that people who are waiting to, uh, you know, hear that, we could get to that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Welcome. Please Thank list you. your I'm name Michelle and address. I'm I live at 5 Buckingham Road. I am a second career registered nurse and currently pursuing my MSN. Um, this topic really touches me. Um, I'm glad Susan um, Scarpa filled me in on the fact that we are the only town in Essex County without a senior center. Um, growing up, my grandparents were my babysitters. And a lot of times when I was off from school, they would take me to their senior group. And I could see the joy that they had by being there. I actually started my nursing career about six months before the COVID pandemic hit. My first job was in an adult medical daycare. Um, what I saw was the social interaction that all the people had. Sometimes this was their best meal of the day. Sometimes these people lived alone. This was their only social interaction. Um, this was their chance to have a medical checkup. As um, part of my um, schooling, at, at, I'm at Montclair State for my MSN. I, this semester I'm enrolled in a public health class. I actually um, volunteered for the West Orange Department of Health um, to go around giving booster shots to our homebound seniors. Um, even for them, like this was, they got to see people, a new person, somebody to talk to, it gave them time for social interaction. So obviously, even during the pandemic, I felt the problems of isolation in a sense. Even though I was working, I was going out, I could sense the difference. It affected me. So I can't even imagine what people that couldn't even leave their house went through. We heard all the stories about people in the nursing homes not being allowed to have visitors and how that impacted them. I really feel that we should put the senior center here. It'll give us more opportunity to reach the seniors. Montclair State, I can't imagine that maybe they would come volunteer to do health screenings, give boosters there, give vaccines there. Um, when I was actually giving the homebound seniors the COVID boosters, they, we were asked if we were gonna give flu vaccines, which doesn't happen, but maybe that's something we can give at the senior center. We can do health screenings. I, you know, I just feel it's so important that we give them the opportunity. I hope that we will re, um, start the senior advisory committee I also would be willing to help as a medical professional, as a nurse, any way that I could. Um, I've been in West Orange for over 20 years myself. I will eventually approach that senior status. I'm a little further away than some of my other friends, but I will get there. I don't plan on leaving West Orange. I would hope by the time I get there that I will be able to have that social interaction with others. So I really hope that after this meeting that you will consider 
um, the Senior Advisory Committee, as well as the Senior Center at Toby Katz. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, good evening. The two, the two people that represented the senior citizen uh, desire for, for more programs have really given you much more than I can do, except I knew when I knew, oh, I see. Okay, my name is Lee Saul, and I live at 47 Carteret Street, not far from the Toby Cat Center. In fact, it's part of my backyard. It has been, it has not been used since the pandemic for senior citizen programs. It was used before that, several years before, and it was very well used. Um, there were exercise programs in the morning. There were various um, game programs, and what my husband and I were able to participate in, on Wednesdays, they had a three-piece band that Toby Katz got, and so there was dancing. Well, we did take off from our business several times to go dancing in our own backyard. It was very, very pleasant, a wonderful break, but we knew also that there were there was um, a chess club mm -hmm. that met there, and uh, so men and women were accommodated by this, the wonderful programs at the Toby Katz Center. Toby Katz was on the council for more than 10 years, and was her, her pet project was working for programs for senior citizens. She was excellent at it. And we all, we all really benefited by it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Oh, good evening. Good evening. Your name and address, please. Seven Cedar Avenue, Arsha Daziz. I was here last time, a few weeks back, and all the answers which I got has far away from from reality about the seniors program and we don't have a single program and the booklet which we got it uh, from here it was from the state of New Jersey it has nothing to do with West Orange so that was I was really disappointed there's only two numbers which are uh, in that booklet uh, about West Orange and which was uh, which was not functional so that is uh, just we need advisory board and the rest we will do ourselves. I know Susan very well and I wanted to start some program about the environment, mm -hmm. environmental awareness, but, it, uh, but I was not able to do anything in this town. I am very active in Maplewood, especially the garden club of, of Maplewood. I help uh, Cindy to to elect her with her niece, and I have her personal phone number also. When I was having my exhibition in West Orange Public Library, I invited her, and I had few other exhibitions in this town, but uh, I never got any uh, re reply from her. And Mr. Weatherford asked me to email him and I emailed him uh, last week and hopefully I will get the answer still we have a time so you can reply my email so basically we just need advisory board and rest we will take care of it either you want that advisory board or you don't want so the matter is really yes or no so there is nothing more than that are you interested or you are not interested? So I know Suzanne, Cindy, and ho so hopefully 
they will help me this time. Uh, in in past, I did not have any good uh, impression, so I am sorry for that. And we on the panel we have the majority, second largest majority, and the third largest majority. But the, I am the real minority in this town, and I am paying my taxes, and I am not getting anything in return. And I am just asking to have that senior advisory board for the whole public, not just for the minority. I was born and raised in Kenya. If you want to call me brother, I have no problem. I will be able to, because there's a lot of favorism. Like, you know, whenever you see your own type of people, you always jump. So if someone wants to call me brother, that's okay. And I will be very helpful to the town, to the senior citizens, to raise money for their cause and to serve them with all my good intentions. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to wrap up the seniors here. Yep. Ladies first, Susan Lesnick. OK. Good evening, Joe Krakowiak, Grandview Avenue. Uh, as, the, as the councilman, I drafted the Senior Citizen Advisor Board Ordinance. I couldn't get anybody to second it, uh, second my motion to introduce so we could discuss and vote on it. So I'm very pleased to hear all of the people who are still pushing for that. And I'm happy to help in any way I can. Is there any update on the outage of public access TV, or should I say outrage? I think it's been well over two months since anyone has been able to watch the video of council meetings at a time just before an election when interest is probably at its highest. And I probably don't have to remind you that seniors uh, watch the public access TV frequently. I see yet another secret executive session to discuss the contract with the new downtown redeveloper who was chosen without competition. Here's a radical idea. Why don't you stop this headlong rush to get a contract before the end of the year and let the new mayor try to do what he or she wants without tying his or her hands with this contract? I'd appreciate a response from everybody. As with each executive session, the authorizing resolution has language reflecting the State Open Public Meetings Act. It says, quote, it is further resolved that the minutes of said discussion shall be made public as soon as the matter under discussion is no longer a of a confidential or sensitive nature, such that the public interest will no longer be served by such confidentiality, end quote. I couldn't find any of these meetings from the executive sessions at all on the website, even though you have council meeting minutes online back to January 4th, 2011. Where are the executive meeting minutes on the website? If they are not on the website when the regular meeting minutes are, it's my understanding that that could be a violation of the Open Public Meetings Act. When was the last time executive session minutes were put on the township website or made public at all? If they aren't there, why not? Where's the transparency? Resolution 266.22, the administration is asking for authorization from the council to borrow nearly $51.6 million to roll over nearly $53.4 million in existing debt, including $45.3 million in one-year debt known as bond anticipation notes or bans. Council members already voted to borrow $113 million over the last three years in the midst of raging inflation, exploding interest rates, and ballooning debt service, raising our total outstanding debt 77% to $142 million. So this should be a piece of cake. What is the amount you want to borrow $1.8 million less than the borrowings you want to refinance? Is that a typo or is that the actual number and how could you explain it? Let's look at the ranges of interest rates the town will have to pay on the largest segment of borrowing bans. In particular, the 2021 financial statement indicates that the $12 million borrowed to buy Rock Spring Golf Club carries an interest rate of 0.75%. That's about double what the town paid originally in 2019, correct? What's the annual interest on that 0.75%? Well, 
I figure it's $90,000. Remember that number. Now here's the real question. What's the interest rate and interest cost you expect on the new bands? You've got bands from last year with 2% interest rates in the financial statement. Rates have doubled and more this year. Some New Jersey band transactions so far this year have carried 4% rates. That would be about $480,000 annually just on the $12 million Rock Spring borrowing. That's just shy of the $580,000 you're projecting the facility will bring in revenue this year. The club isn't such a great deal anymore at those interest rates. And 4% interest on the $45.3 million in bands would be more than $1.8 million. So how does that compare to what we would raise in a, with a 2% tax increase? Mr. Gross and the council, how could you let this happen? Mr. Gross, you're supposed to be the finance expert. Do you wish you had listened to me when I was on the council and frequently warning that we had too much short-term debt? Why aren't you rolling much of this into longer-term debt at fixed rates since the Federal Reserve is intent on raising rates further? What's the 10 and 20-year municipal rate these days? What's the difference between the annual interest cost and all-in rate on this debt now, and what do you expect after you go to market? How much time did you spend over the last two years telling the council and the public about this fin financial disaster in the making? What did you do, and what are we going to do now? Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Susan Lenchuk, 234 Eagle Rock Avenue. Once again, I'm here to talk about the forest at the top of Mount Pleasant Avenue. But first, a word about Crestmont. Public funds were involved in purchasing the Crestmont property, which was preserved as open space. Crestmont is completely surrounded by private property and therefore has no public access. It also has no public use. The same situation appears to be the case with Wiley Terrace, which was pur purchased and preserved in 2012. So it is puzzling that two members of this council object to using public funds to purchase the property bordered by Mount Pleasant Avenue and Ridge Road based on lack of public access and lack of public use. This reflects a lack of consistency in the criteria used for considering properties to preserve. Clearly, there are precedents for acquiring properties such as this one. Furthermore, there is something else to consider. If the township purchases the property, then it obviously becomes a property owner on Ridge Road. As a property owner, the township and its citizens and its guests have the same rights and privileges as any other property owner on the road. And those rights and privileges, of course, include access. So to the two council members who object to the purchase of the property based on lack of access, would that not dissolve your concern about access? And if the two members still have that concern, then I ask again, what is the difference between Crestmont and the forest at the top of Mount Pleasant? Whether or not the application to develop the property comes before the planning board, I think that it's important that those two questions be settled. I look forward to your response. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, hi. Uh, Mark Meyerwitz, 19 Howell Drive. Uh, I wasn't originally going to say anything tonight, so I was just going to sit and listen. But when I saw that I had the next mayor in the room, I had to, <laughs> had to take my chances and open my mouth. So I don't have much to say. But there are a few things I was thinking about government. And uh, there are a few suggestions that I would think that uh, should be discussed. Um, Number one is that we're going to be having a new mayor, and it would be nice if the mayor were to attend town council meetings once in a while. 
I know when you have a hospital board, in the hospital board meetings, the uh, heads of the hospital, president of the hospital, they attend the meetings. So I think it would be good for the, for the new mayor to make it a practice of attending, you know, maybe half the meetings or whatever they can, just so that they can be more in touch with the population of the town. My second suggestion is that we, I usually don't advocate for more public employees and more, but that we add a few town council seats by district, not because everybody right now is at large, but I think it would also be appropriate to add three or four people, expand the council somewhat, so that each district is representative. Because now I, don't, I really don't know what part of town you will live in. You call, could live in you know one, one happy family townhouse or something like that, but you know we should make sure that every district in the town is represented. Is rep represented. So uh, that was something to discuss. Um, and my last comment is, we do need term limits, and this is not a com term limits is not a commentary on how you have done as a council person or as mayor or anything like that. It's not a question of of you know, how good you are, how bad you were, whatever it is. It's just a, a way of getting fresh blood into, you know, uh, into the government. And it's a way of making sure that uh, new people have, have, you know, can come in with fresh ideas. And that, you know, it, it is possible that people create their own fiefdoms, their own little, uh, Spheres of influence, if, if that's the right word, it's not really the right word. But, you know, you, you don't want to have a situation where someone is just constantly automatically re-elected and re-elected and re-elected. Because that's not really representative government. Thank you. Evening, everybody. I'm Darnell Gibbs, 206 Tremont Avenue, Orange New Jersey. So I'd like to uh, start off by introducing myself, like I always do every council meeting. So I'm Darnell Gibbs. I've served in the military for 12 plus years. I'm on my 13th year now. I've deployed to locations such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Kuwait, Syria, Lebanon, Africa. Outside of that, I'm the deputy director for Excess County Cops for Kids. It's a nonprofit organization here in Excess County that exposes the youth at, um, they expose this to the youth to police officers. So we're trying to bridge a gap in between the law enforcement and local communities. Uh, we just was recently acknowledged by the city of Newark for the police academy we just attended in the summer. Uh, we came in first place overall, all right? So that's that. Well, on August 22nd, we were informed by Chief Abbott that there was a reservation as it relates to our proposed location on Main Street due to the proximity to another applicant that was supported by the town. This applicant was chemistry, which according to the proposed resolution, the library tonight has since moved in. I was under the impression that this was the sole reason our application was sort of delayed by the council, but since chemistry did not did in fact confirm they were no longer at this location, why was not our application process for our location? Given prior since, given prior since we had this application in for six months. I believe last meeting it was stated that the applicants were reviewed in the order in which they were received, and here we are now still waiting for a resolution while two applicants that submitted at us has already been heard and recommended by the council. I'd like to officially know what is, the, what is the selection process and why is chemistry's new location hasn't been disclosed and, why, and when can we look to speak to the task force in regarding our new, post, our new proposed location in which we just recently obtained, okay? I just wanna say something real quick before my time expire. It's been said by numerous council members, okay, that this process is a very, very tiresome and expensive process, all right? Just to make everybody aware again, I took out loans, not only in my name, but also in my wife's name to start this process once we opened my company back in 2019. So I'm not new to the cannabis industry. 
Also on top of that, I was able to secure funding from a bank that's willing to finance 110% of my overall cost to start for the first year of operation, okay? The military taught me two things, okay? They taught me a lot, but the two things that apply to this process right now is gonna be patience and the ability to overcome obstacles. I've been patiently waiting to be in front of the task force to ease any concern they may have with my location. I've yet been awarded the opportunity to do so. When it comes to overcoming obstacles, I've overcome a lot of obstacles. You can ask anyone that's interested in the cannabis business or any business whatsoever. If you start your own business, funding is not an easy thing to obtain. One, it starts one, a solid business plan, and then two, a solid personal credit, in which I have both, okay? The obstacle that I first had to overcome was the proximity to another location, which is a gentleman um, and the company named The Library. This was told to the task force. We had no problems whatsoever being neighbors. We didn't have a problem with it, but the task force said it was an issue. All right? The next thing that we had to overcome was brought up the concern of traffic. I started a traffic study in April once I secured this lease for this location. This traffic study was... Um, this traffic study showed that there would be minimum traffic congestion with my proposed location of Main Street. In fact, there was more traffic buildup with the bus stop than there was anyone pulling into the location that we had proposed to the town. The next thing that was mentioned was the reference into the occupancy in the location. It was worried about that the location that we originally proposed would be overcrowded, all right? I visited four locations throughout the state of New Jersey. Not one location has been overcrowded since the first day they opened on April 21st. As for the occupancy code, it states that you're allowed 50 square feet for every one person. Our original pose location had a square footage of 2,300 feet, allowing us a maximum 47 personnel in our location at any one given time. As per our business plan and the way it was laid out that we were implementing an order ahead process. So this way, we could reduce the amount of occupancy, amount of guests that we have in our location at any one given time. So once again, thank you for your time. Look forward to hearing all the responses. The man that needs no introduction. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, Anthony Puglisi, representing County Executive Joe DiVincenzo. I uh, just want to make you aware of some upcoming events and, um, and changes at the county level. First, on October 29th, that's our last day that the Sears vaccination site is going to be open. Uh, it's run continuously for two years. Uh, we are going to continue our mobile vaccination program. Um, so residents who do need to get, uh, still get their vaccines should check our website, EssexCountyNJ.org or EssexCOVID.org uh, for that mobile schedule. Uh, that schedule is updated on a weekly basis. Um, on Saturday, we're going, on October 29th, we're going to continue our Strut Your Mutt uh, Dog Parades. Uh, the first one's at 9 a.m. in Brookdale Park. The second one's at 1 p.m. in Grover Cleveland Park. Um, November 5th, which is also a Saturday from 8 a.m. to 12 noon at our Public Works facility in Cedar Grove, that's 99 West Bradford Avenue. We're going to have our uh, fall paper shredding event. Um, residents can just drive up. Uh, we do the rest. We'll take everything out of your car just like we do at all our other events. Uh, and then finally, uh, November 18th is the return of our Holiday Light Spectacular at Turtleback Zoo. Uh, that's going to continue for um, the first three weeks just on the weekends, um, and then it continues on a daily basis through uh, December 31st. Um, all this information is on our website, um, and if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you, Anthony. Okay. Madam, uh, sorry, Councilwoman Kessler. Thank you. I know, I know we're going out of our usual protocol, but with Mr. Puglisi here, that... that uh, Yes. Just real quick question, with the open house um, lighting, will you have like um, people there for the traffic, officers there for traffic control? I know we had a few warm nights 
last year and it was mega crowded. Will that be um, looked at this year? Yes, we are working with the sheriff's office to um, uh, control the traffic. Uh, one thing that should be noticed is that since we've opened the uh, third parking deck on the site, uh, we haven't had any uh, backups on Northfield Avenue. Obviously, if you were going to get a very large number of people, it's going to be uh, an impact. But uh, generally, since, like I said, since we've opened that third parking deck, um, we've only actually had to open parking at the Cherry Lane Archery Field uh, three times in the last year. Oh, great. Thank you. Anthony, I had a question. Thank you. Information and the, and the mobile vaccines, too, to keep that uh, current. Um, with all of the events that Essex County has between the paper shredding and the hazardous waste, re the electronics recycling, would it be possible or, or would you consider doing a Saturday or alternating between Saturday and Sunday? We have a population in town that cannot participate in events that happen on Saturdays and is that, can consideration be given um, to just alter alternate the days? So consideration is already being given because for the household hazardous waste yes. and the computer electronics, if they call the Essex County Utilities Authority, they can drop off their items the Friday before. Uh, that's difficult for some people to do also. Um, with Fridays and Saturdays, Friday evenings and Saturdays. So that's why I was asking if it, we can alternate Saturdays and Sundays. It, it's or something I can bring that. up. I can bring them up, but we've we've made that uh, arrangement so far. But it can be updated. I'll I'll okay. talk to our ECUA. And that information is on the website that people would know to come on a Friday afternoon or any time on a Friday. Uh, I guess that's more of a word of mouth type of thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so even so, to promote that in the meantime, yeah. I think would be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a population of people that we need to take that into consideration. Yes. Thank you. Oh, yes, Councilwoman. Mr. Puglisi, I had a question just in reference to public comment that was made earlier um, with West Orange being the only municipality in Essex County to not have a senior cent center. Um, by any chance, can you speak to that? with the other municipalities and what facilities they have. There's 22 different municipalities in Essex <laughs> County. So I can... I can bring that question to our senior services office and get back to you. Thank you. I'm not I appreciate versed, that. They're, they're versed in that area of expertise. I'm not. So I can bring that to them. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Puglisi, can you just tell us again the start date for the holiday lights? Was that the 13th? The first day is November 18th. 18th. That's a Friday evening. Thank you. And Anthony, we spoke previously about another grant that just came in that it might be been a Department of Transportation grant that just came in that would be more beneficial if we pool our resources with our municipalities in the county. Um, and not just with West Orange. So I will share that with you so that you can ask County Executive for that consideration as well. Sure, definitely. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, I know we have comments on Zoom. Yes, Council President. We have um, several members uh, in the Zoom audience. I'd like to announce now uh, that any member of the public in the Zoom audience who cares to address the town council can do so by using the raise your hand function at the bottom of your computer screen. If you do not see it or not familiar with it, just move your mouse cursor along the bottom of the screen and it will become visible. Once your hand is raised, you will be in the queue and I will call upon you by the name you entered the Zoom meeting with. You may raise your hand at any time, and I apologize beforehand if I mispronounce your name. Uh, first up, we have uh, Sally Malanga. Um, Sally Malanga, uh, welcome to the meeting. Uh, please state your name and address for the record. Sally Malanga, 57 Ridge Road. Go ahead. Thank you very much. On behalf of our Green West Orange members, 
Uh, first, I do support Joe Krakowiak's comments on postponing the contract for the downtown film studio until we have a new administration and also some insight as to what it's all about so that the public may understand the direction of the downtown. I also commend Sue Lynchick for comments about a fair hearing for open space acquisitions. I'd like to open up the discussion about resolution 26922 for tree planting, which calls for $80,000 for 200 unspecified trees. How was this number of trees arrived at? We need an assessment determining exactly how many trees we lose each year and how many trees we need in order to both replenish our canopy and create flooding resilience. We spend more time on cannabis than climate change, the single biggest threat to our finances, our prosperity, and our lives. And planting trees is the single most cost-effective way there is to keep all of us safe and happy. Trees have a very important effect on mental health. I became aware that the DEP is now holding hearings on changing stormwater management calculations because stormwater calculations are based on rainfall measurements of 20 years ago. And today's rainfall is between 15 and 50 percent more. So here it is October 2022 and we have not updated our plans and it would be great to join a workshop about what this town needs to stay resilient. So concerning this resolution for the trees, I urge you to postpone it and ask the engineering department and the forester to return with a rationale that is not budget related but that justifies the number of the trees that the town actually needs. Is it 200? Is it 500? Is it more than that? We need to know what is needed to stay afloat during future storms, as well as to specify that these trees are native trees and how they will be watered and where they will be planted. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michaela Bennett, welcome to the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record. Thank you, Mr. Fagan. Um, uh, Madam um, Clerk, I would just ask for a moment so I can um, raise a point of order information with the uh, president. Um, but my name is Michaela Bennett and I live on Old Indian Road. So I don't know if it's possible to change the screen in order for me to be able to see the council as I speak. Is that possible, Mr. Fagan? No. Uh, I yield to the cameraman. What particular That's view are you looking for? Well, I see my name on the screen, and I was hoping to be able to, as I um, address the council, be able to actually see the council. It should be on your screen. I can see it when you're speaking, but when I speak, I see my name. I don't, okay. know, I don't know it's, that I can control that. Yeah, the moderator controls that, but that's okay. All right, so uh, the point of information, just before my time starts running, the point of information that I wanted to raise is about uh, President uh, McCartney, um, would you be able to insist on order and decorum of council members? I ask because I know Councilwoman Casalino thought it appropriate to call my comments disgusting, and you failed to act when that occurred. The concerns that I raise are to promote honesty, accountability, and transparency. And although they may make some uncomfortable, they're intended to raise important issues that our community deserves um, the respect to raise. So interruptions and utterances and irre irrelevant commentary is improper, and I would ask Council, Council President that you maintain order and decorum throughout comments and responses. Is that possible? Uh, duly any, noted, yes. Thank you. Any, any Thank comments? you. 
Any council member can raise a point of order if they think that somebody's being abusive or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. so we have done that. All right, well, I, the reason I raise it is I watched the video after being told that Councilwoman Castellino called me disgusting and I saw it for myself. And so the reason that I'm asking, I, I don't know if any of the council members on the day is think it's inappropriate to call a community member disgusting or their comments disgusting, but as far as I'm concerned, it's inappropriate and a, and a call for order should have been, should have been made. But with that, mm -hmm. with your assurance that you'll uh, be able to maintain order tonight, I would proceed. Thank you. Um, I plan to read my latest email to the council regarding Councilman Rutherford's willful obstruction of the Oprah. But in light of a letter to the community that I was asked to share, I won't read my letter asking that the council and the administration hold the councilman accountable. He is the person who said that residents called him to the scene of the Watson Street shooting. His records will prove or refute that. His statement you should ensure that he complies with and is held accountable if he doesn't, if he's willfully violating the Oprah. I'm sure he'll spin this, call me names, claim harassment, but he has asserted facts and I seek records that confirm them. So with the time that I have remaining, I wanna read the editorial that was submitted to the Chronicle um, and will be run. Dear West Orange community members, this is not written by me. This is written by a resident on Rock Spring Road. My intention in writing is to give a different perspective as witness of the conduct of Councilman Bill Rutherford at the scene of the drunk driving incident on Rock Spring in September. I am not rehashing this to drag Miss Dooley Malloy. I am hopeful yet diligently watching how her case goes through the justice system and that her accountability now lies in the hands of a judge. I believe in honesty in politics and believe that West Orange deserves public servants who have the best interest of their constituents, not using their power to help their circle. The evening of the incident, Mr. Rutherford was mostly concerned with his friend. He identified her as being an attendee at his event, her status in town, and he did attempt to talk to the police at multiple points that evening, offering his help as a councilman. The fact that he used his position to remain at the scene, get Miss Dooley Malloy released to him, connected her with a lawyer, and was at the precinct at all is very suspicious to me. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people don't realize that he crossed boundaries. I have a degree in political science, have worked many political campaigns, and have had family who are elected officials. So I'm more in tune to the behavior of elected officials. What I witnessed was blurred lines. There is an ethical line that should not be crossed so as not to give any appearance of favoritism or using your position for personal gains. His presence at the scene was to intervene on his friend's behalf. The Rutherford narrative has been that he is a, quote, helper of anyone in need. This may be true, but his actions need more scrutiny than that. He is a councilman, an elected official, who has influence and power in town. He is someone who can propose laws, vote on budgets for the town. This includes money for schools and police. In my opinion, his concern for our street was insincere. I initially believed he was concerned for our neighborhood until he returned a few days later. Not to ask the homeowners Your how he Your time is up. May, I, I would Finish just that ask, sentence, please. Yes. Not to ask the homeowners how he could make our streets safer, but to specifically ask them if they thought he interfered with the police. There's literally just a few more lines left. Please wrap May up. Okay. They have still not heard from him regarding any follow-up on street safety. This is where his access to information and influence would be most helpful. Okay. To get Thank you. Thank you. With, I, I would just ask for the same courtesy that you provided um, there, there was at least a minute given to the other, the other individual. Please wrap up. Okay. Thank to get you. involved, the extent he did with Ms. No, no, it actually means please end. 
you gave at least a minute to a woman standing in front of you. Virtual audience should be given the same courtesy. Okay, then please finish your sentence. Thank you. I thought it important to share a witness's perspective on how the councilman operates and whose interests he served that evening in direct challenge to the narrative he manufactured in his statement about that evening. Thank you. Uh, next Fagan? up, we have Norda Gibbs. Please state your name and address for the record. Hello, good night, everyone. My name is Norda Gibbs, and I reside at 206 Tremont in Orange. I am the COO of Pure Natural Vibes LLC, which is a micro business applicant for our retail space um, for the cannabis business. Um, I, I do see on the agenda tonight that there is a resolution to support the Library of New Jersey, congratulations guys. Um, but on the other hand, I do see there's also a resolution to revoke local support for chemistry. Um, as my husband mentioned earlier, Darnell Gibbs, we were under the impression that our application wasn't pushed through to the council because of the proximity issue with uh, chemistry's location of 24 Park Avenue. Um, we have since then been trying to find a new location um, but my question is, if if the library didn't do due diligence and sought out a lease, um, how would we know that chemistry did not have site control anymore? And this goes to say that there's also a resolution to suspend the acceptance of more applications. But again, like the ones that you've given priority to, or at least a resolution, how do we really know their, their, their process and their status? And if they're really serious about this business, we, we did sign a lease because we're 100% committed to the process. Like you have very serious applicants that are willing to put everything on the line to invest in the township. So again, how do we know? If I now find a new location, again, this comes up again. I'm now told a proximity issue for an applicant that no longer has site control. So is there a way to figure this out before pausing? Because then other people that already have state approval or very serious investors might be defaulted because of a previous support of someone that's not serious or, you know, it's just taking too long or whatever the issue is. I'm, I'm just trying to understand how this ties into everyone else that had previous resolutions and how do we know how far they are in the process of getting support from the state? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gibbs. Any member of the public in the Zoom audience wishing to address the town council, please use the raise the hand function at this time. Last call for any member of the public wishing to address the town council during public comment. Council President, I am seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Fagan. So we're going to close public comment. And I wanted to start with our senior group in attendance this evening and work backwards uh, because I wanted to thank Ms. Lee Saul. Um, for admitting that the Toby Katz Center, to me, has always been our senior center, and it has been underutilized for the past three years with COVID. But not only the Toby Katz Center, um, I do appreciate this idea of a senior working group. And what resonated with me at the last meeting, when many of you were here, um, was actually willing to volunteer and seek grants and to participate in such a board. So I was not, I thought you were going to come back and say, how come it's not on the agenda tonight? Um, and I thought that the timing is not right to put it on the agenda tonight, though I do believe that there could be a senior committee, but set up just like all of our other committees, mayoral appointments, town, town council um, appointments, 
and of course volunteers from the community. So I, I do see that happening. I don't see it happening now because in less than two months time, there will be a brand new administration. But I, I would recommend some, you know, I feel like our senior service coordinator and her staff need very little encouragement and what they need are people to help facilitate these programs. Um, I appreciate the professionalism of the people that came. I appreciate Mr. Azad because after he did have a, an exhibit at the West Orange Arts Council, I met with him and I was excited because he recycles fabrics and textiles and I thought that that would be a beautiful tie-in with the Environmental Commission, but now it could be a workshop for seniors as well. So I agree with what you're saying. I just, I feel a little disappointed to say that we don't have a senior center because I always believe that the Toby Cat Center was, is our senior center, but truthfully it has been underutilized, but not through any fault of anyone here in town, but because of COVID. We also have 7,500 square feet at the new proposed um, senior housing apartments, um, right where our current library is, and that is for a community space with a health center there, and at our newly proposed library on Rooney Circle. There will be state-of-the-art state of the art library with um, plenty of space to accommodate. We also have our town pool that there's so many programs there. It seems like we have so many different sections in town where we can do senior programs, and even at the Toby Cat Center with the Master Gardeners. Um, a beautiful program there that everything they grow, they have a luncheon, invite the community. Uh, there as well. I really appreciate it. The expertise, um, Dr. Dorf, um, Sheila Lefkowitz, thank you, um, and also Ms. Malik coming in that if you are willing to participate and volunteer, then that's the first step that's needed to assist our senior services office. So I appreciate you coming in, and I think that is something. Um, new administration uh, should should undertake uh, creating an ordinance to create a senior committee uh, to help our senior services court, uh, office. Did I miss anybody? And like I said, I think that um, I appreciate your advocacy and what resonated with me were the, actually the things that you were going to tackle like grant writing and seeking other things, that could actually put these programming in place. So thank you for coming to address that. Uh, Mr. Krakowiak talked about these negotiations that were still not being transparent. Um, their negotiations and um, as a former colleague, you know that that is not public information at this time because we are still in the process of negotiating that. I'm going to the other questions. Mr. Gross, I know Sunday at our recent debate, I did mention that the state limit for our debt was 3.5% and we are currently at 1.65%. I don't think that resonated with Mr. Krakowiak. So can you please talk about the interest rate on this resolution? Yeah, I mean, th two? this is a, um, a housekeeping resolution. Generally, you don't see these, uh, but because some of the uh, issues that, that I'm, we're, we're looking to finance tonight, or this coming up this month, are, are older, uh, under older ordinances, and, and, those, and those, those ordinances, um, didn't meet the, the standards today for the requirements, so we had to do this resolution. Um, but to get to the point, I mean, if you read the resolution, and Mr. Krukovac did, uh, all, many many of the details of, of this, what we're doing, are, are within the, the body of, of the resolution. Um, and so uh, I guess what I'll, one of the things I'll address is that, you know, Mr. Krakowiak's talking about the, the fact that interest rates are on the incline um, and that uh, there, there may have been an opportunity, he, he alluded to, opportunities to finance all of our debt now or, or a year ago when the rates were lower 
uh, and that we would lock in the, the lower rates, which would have been a really great idea, except that that also means that you have to pay about one twelfth of the principal a year. So that would have been, that would have kicked in about a $4.3 million increase in just principal costs. So, you know, it, it is a balancing act uh, of making these decisions. Uh, we, we are where we are. We, we, we have aggressively been uh, converting um, our debt into um, um, long-term debt during the, the, the low interest periods. Uh, and, um, but you, you know, we really can't, can't, really could not do that and maintain stable tax rates, which is what also our priority. So it's a balancing act of priorities. And, uh, you know, and, and while we were in an inclining interest rate environment, um, clearly we are anticipating that that, that will peak and, and start to come back down. And of course, I'm not going to sit here and, and predict rates, um, but, uh, but that the anticipation is that over, over time that that will be, that we'll get more opportunities to, to come in with lower interest rates in the future. So um, I, I respect and understand uh, Mr. Hukoviak's focus on this, but the truth is that there's there's a lot of practical things that go into making these decisions. Not the least of which is the the impact today on our taxpayers. So, thank you, Mr. Groats. Um, and Susan Lesnick again. Um, you know, we have had this conversation already. This is about the 12 acres on Ridge Road. It is a private road. Um, I still struggle or ask myself, uh, is it an environmental issue or is it a financial issue for the township? And I keep leaning, maybe it's the Libra and me trying to find the balance here, but um, I see it more as an economic issue rather than an environmental issue. Uh, yes, the township would become the property owner. And to say that we have access to Ridge Road, I don't really know how far down Ridge Road we can go. It's only the first um, feet, first few hundred feet in the uh, at number two and number 10 Ridge Road. Um, where do we park cars? Uh, we would have to maintain that historic wall. We would have to maintain the forest itself. Uh, to protect people if they do feel like traveling through there. I believe that there is a fence on that uh, rock cliff. We would have to maintain that. Um, we would be liable for anyone that is walking through there. And we would also have to bond additional funds to acquire that property. So I really am not in favor of purchasing that those particular 12 acres at this time. The 94 acres at Crestmont that you mentioned, I did vote to purchase. It did clear tax appeals that were pending there. And it was also in threat of a conceptual plan for 300 units to be built there. So I saw that as a threat and need to protect. And, I, and I'm sorry that uh, I'm sorry that we don't agree on that. Um, Mr. Meyerowitz, thank you for your comments and coming down uh, to our council meeting. I really wanted to say that I commend my colleagues over the years for serving at large regardless of where they live. So uh, adding additional members to a council will also increase our municipal budget. And I believe that uh, my colleagues do uh, a job, not just this council, but uh, the years that I served, which is my segue for term limits. Because as you know, I have been elected by this community um, for five consecutive terms. So that wasn't my doing. That was the community voting me in. Um, and Mr. Gibbs, Mr. and Mrs. Gibbs, um, I wanted to first say what a gentleman you are, and you have been patient um, and very kind uh, overcoming this obstacle. Um, and congratulations on your Essex uh, Cops with Kids. Um, I'm not sure if you were here in the beginning of our session where we had uh, one of our lieutenants talking about similar program that we're doing here in town. Congratulations on that. Um, 
I think, I think the process is convoluted also. Um, I think with very little guidance from the state, our task force did the best they could to sift through these applications. Uh, there is a resolution right now to suspend that so that they can catch up with what we have to determine where we are. So um, I think I'm going to leave that to the chair of the uh, Cannabis Task Force to address um, all of your concerns. I don't understand the close proximity because we do have two cultivators operating in close proximity. Um, and I don't, I don't have those answers for you, I'm sorry to say. We do have our town engineer here for um, a comment that was made about the tree planting. Len, do we know what, uh, what is necessary? Could you just come up and answer that question on the tree planting? And while our town engineer is coming up, I do want to say that council and personnel uh, have mandatory storm, storm water training pending right now. If you haven't taken that class, uh, that course, we do. We did receive an email on storm order uh, enhancement training. So, Loma, the question was about the number of tree plantings and why. Where, how did the 200 number come about in this resolution? Well, what I'd like to point out is it's it's not just the 200 that we're seeking through this uh, contract award. Uh, in the past couple of weeks, we planted a little over 100 trees, okay. and that's amongst the trees we planted on High Street, 35. Uh, another part road project we planted 63 and another road project we planted 16 um, those were mostly state grants uh, that allowed that so it's not just limited to the 200 that are here but another hundred plus where we planted um, there Ms. Malanga did ask a very good question about what are our needs we are currently conducting a, an inventory of mm -hmm. our street shade trees so that we can plan better, uh, not just what may need to be trimmed or pruned or considered hazardous and removed, but also where we can plant trees and how we uh, can make sure that we are planting more than we're removing. And I was glad to see, I don't know if you want to comment on this, but we do have a resolution for a, a forester and a tree care, who is a tree care expert. Right, and, and that's uh, in response to an RFQ. And, and that's for the remainder of the year. Excellent. OK. You may have, if you want to sit right here, you may have more questions when uh, others comment. And thank you, Lenny, for being here. Uh, the comments from Ms. Bennett, Michaela Bennett, um, presiding over this council, I believe that we have been patient and very civil. But I do recall when I was council president a few years back that twice I had to call behavior deplorable for people to think that they should come to a council meeting to publicly humiliate individuals. So I'm, I would use that word again, um, that I just don't think that's what our council meetings are about, to come and publicly, publicly humiliate people. Let me see. That's, that's all I have on my notes. And I address Mrs. Gibbs um, along with her husband. And Anthony, thank you very much for your comments. And Joe, also for all the information that you share with us. Thank you. Backwards. All right, we'll go backwards this time. Councilwoman Williams. Thank you, Council President. Thank you always West Orange residents virtually and in person who came out to share your uh, comments with us this evening. I appreciate all of the feedback and will certainly take everything into consideration whether it is commented by me this evening or not. Um, certainly with the senior um, facility, senior center, um, and, and I wanted to just state that I really don't think it's us as elected officials missing or misunderstanding um, the, the ask or the request or the um, importance of making sure uh, we provide programming, activities, um, stability for our seniors. Um, quite frankly, I think that the biggest challenge that we have in the municipality is communication of the programming that we do have. Um, oftentimes, mm -hmm. I am, as an elected official, sometimes shocked 
um, to find out new information about opportunities, places, events, um, things that go on in our community. And hopefully, because I do have um, the next mayor at my disposal sitting in this room, <laughs> oh, I think one candidate has um, exited the building, unfortunately. Um, hopefully, we will do um, a better job at communicating all of the things and tying all of the loose ends together um, when we do have our, our next administration. I look forward to, to that opportunity and improving and making sure all of our residents know all of the activities that we have here, the support services, because, you know, we really do have a lot of um, things going on in our community, and it's just... Um, disheartening when we understand that people just don't know about them, but mm -hmm. we do. Good um, as far as um, Ridge Road Forest is concerned, certainly duly noted about the importance of climate change and the protection that that tree canopy um, provides, um, as well as uh, the commentary on uh, cannabis. I, I, I heard that some uh, one of our commenters noted that we spend more time on cannabis um, than we do on climate change. Um, cannabis is a new industry. We are trying to grasp and understand how it is going to impact um, and affect our community. So not to say that uh, climate change is not important. Um, we're just trying to make sure uh, we craft this new industry um, to the benefit of our community in the best way that we can. Uh, thank you, Mr. Paclisi. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fagan, as always, for your comments. Also wanted to just um, make note, sometimes when we do have commentary, which is to the reason why I asked Mr. Paglisi if he could speak to the senior um, facilities, that was, uh, as the comment was, that we're the only um, community that does not have a senior <laughs> facility or center. Um, with the beauty of Google, um, just as we were sitting here, and I couldn't take up too much time because I wanted to give my undivided attention to other residents as they were speaking. Um, but Bloomfield has a, a location, but it is closed um, until further notice. West Caldwell as well. Um, they have a, f a facility, but it's closed um, due to COVID. Caldwell, same. Um, Maplewood, South Orange, they did not have a facility um, that I could identify quickly, but they do have a partnership with AARP um, to network um, with their age-friendly communities. So again, I just I don't want um, comments from the public to be misrepresented, and certainly Mr. Paclisi will come back with um, confirmation of what municipalities in Essex County do or do not have an actual senior facility. But I do encourage, and I'm strongly supportive of having more activities for our seniors and a location. Um, so that they can receive some extended services. I understand that at some point we used to have a health department um, where seniors could go into um, that department and receive some additional services. But again, we're coming out on the cusp of COVID. Seniors are still, um, you know, still very much at risk um, as far as the population is concerned, as far as health-wise. But we do know um, that isolation and, and socialization are two key components of making sure our seniors are taken care of. But not only just our seniors, um, we need to make sure we have activities for our youth as well. So again, um, we have a tremendous amount of programming through the rec department for our youth. Um, we just need to, and, and other organizations do programming as well. Um, we have tremendous um, volunteer organizations and opportunities in the community. Um, but again, I do stress and I hope um, with the new incoming administration, um, that we're able to really assess all the things that go on in West Orange and get some central communication system so everybody knows the beautiful things that are going on in our community. Um, thank you, Council President. Thank That's you. it for me this evening. Councilman Rutherford, though, just before, Joe, one of the comments, um, Joe Fagan, one of the comments I missed was about the West Orange High School LMC studio. Have you received any, I know you shared an email with me at our last council meeting. Have you received any updates on that? No, I have not, Council I President. And it is out of the jurisdiction of the uh, municipal government. Right. It is completely controlled by the West Orange Board of Education. Mm -hmm. And we have, uh, to my knowledge, we have no say in that. Right. I'll have Thank that. you. I'll have that in my comment. All right, great. Mr. Rutherford. 
Uh, thank you, Council President. Thank you, Mr. Fagan, Mr. Puglisi, for your timely and informative comments, as usual. Um, to Dr. Doerr and uh, Susan Scarpa and all of those that advocated for a, a senior advisory board and senior center, uh, you can consider me an ally in that. Um, your three questions, Ms. Scarpa, do I support the working group? Yes. The advisory board? Yes. Uh, and I do think we should have uh, a senior center in town. Like uh, Council President, though, I know that the posture of this current administration is not to do that. And so while we may propose and suggest and advocate, um, this current administration has decided not to go down that pathway. So uh, I am very happy to pick that ball up in January with a new administration. And I do believe just about every, if not every council candidate has said that, uh, I mean, a mayoral candidate has said that they would be supportive um, of both of those efforts. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, Mr. Aziz, I do thank you for reaching out. I did not see your email on Friday. I believe it was in my spam, but I have since responded to you. Um, Mr. Krakowiak, um, I think it's important to just say, and I'm going to ask Mr. Gross a couple of questions, but I think it's important to preface those questions with executive sessions are not secretive in some nefarious sense. Um, they are a normal part of doing the business of town. Um, we've engaged in them uh, as appropriate here, uh, as prior councils have when you were on the council. Um, and so it is nothing nefarious. It is simply a tool that we use to handle uh, discussions about sensitive information that is not yet ready for the public. Um, Mr. Gross, I, I, you know, I understand the concerns, and we've had this conversation in the two years that I've been on the council uh, with regard to debt and interest rates and so on and so forth. Uh, but in your defense, and to preface the, the questions that are going to come, um, what is our debt rating as a municipality? Do you know? Double A. Double A. Double A. A and that's generally considered it's not just pretty good. good. That's like our size. Yeah. yeah. That's that's yeah. And the ratings agencies, are they, can you tell me something about them? Are they independent? Are they, do we pay for that yeah, rating? We, we pay, we, we, we do pay for it, mm -hmm. but it is independent. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we, uh, we contract and, and pay, they offer, it's a, it's a service they offer to the financial industry based on the, the entity that's borrowing money and that they pay for it. Uh, and we go through a rigorous, uh, um, development of a uh, of an official statement with a, with all kinds of facts about the town and about our operations and about what the money's being used for, and then we have there's an interview process and where they grill us over our practices and they look pretty pretty deep into what we're doing, and they come up with an opinion. We've um, you know we we've been in an era where there's been a lot of downward pressure. Uh, in in the ratings, and we've managed to maintain our double A rating now for um, since I've been here. So we, we attained it while I was here, and we've maintained it. So um, it is. Uh, uh, I think it's an accomplishment, and it's uh, it, it, it's it's based on you know the efforts of everyone. You know, in terms of uh, our budgetary focuses and 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 the balancing of the different needs we have within the community. And, and those ratings uh, produced by the ratings agency are relied on by the investment public when they make the decision whether or not to purchase our debt. Is that true? That's exactly what they're for. So if they didn't have confidence in the ratings agency, they probably wouldn't buy the debt because they wouldn't have any clear line of sight into what they're buying. It's fair to say. Okay. Um, with regard to debt retirement expectations, um, given whatever you can speak about publicly. Uh, certainly with regard to Rock Spring, there is some uh, expectation that that debt will be paid down in, a, in an accelerated fashion uh, because we will uh, preserve it as open space and apply for Green Acres funding. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say, and it's not just that, there's numerous issues of our debt we would not go long in because we don't anticipate that we're going to maintain that, that debt for you know more than... You know, cer certainly not 10 to 12 years. We, we anticipate getting 
uh, that debt moved down before then. So that would not be a portion of the debt that we would convert. Uh, so Rock, that, that Rock Spring is one of those. Uh, Crestmont is one of those. Uh, even properties that we've uh, purchased for redevelopment uh, since we anticipate turning those properties over. This, this, those, are, those are temporary. That's temporary debt for us. Right, so it's appropriate in those particular cases to keep the debt in, you know, in short-term instruments so that we don't have to pay principal and interest and a higher interest rate. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, not to mention the, 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 the cost, which is not insignificant, the cost of, of, of converting, doing, well, of, of, of going out to bond, uh, to actually selling bonds. There's, there's a transactional cost. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, again, you, you wouldn't want to waste that money. All right, thank you. So, so now those are the questions that I felt would be relatively easy to answer and that would kind of set the context for what we're dealing with. I do think we still have some issues, and, um, and, I, and I am interested in Mr. Krakowiak's question about the difference between our current debt service and anticipated debt service. Um, and I know that's a hard one to figure out because it depends on when we convert and how much we convert at that time, what the yield curve does. Uh, but do you have any line of sight into that for the next, you know, year or two? Well, I, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, if, and in, if, if uh, history um, is, is a judge of this, I could make some which would be purely guesses. I'm not going to do that here tonight. But, but certainly in um, my 30-some years of experience, there are certain... Um, estimates that I would make personally uh, and, and, and make recommendations of what to do and make decisions based on what in my gut I think that we face. We've, we've never faced in, in our lifetime what we're looking at right now, but, but there, are, there are similarities. So I, I think that the decisions that have been made right now, um, this year we're not going to go long because I think this is Probably we're, we're either at the top or pretty near the top uh, for this period. Um, at least that's, that's what I'm reading in the literature uh, and, and, and the minds that, that, that I pay attention to seem to think that. Um, and that's why I think that you know, we're, we're probably going to peak over the next couple of years, as I said before. And when it goes down, there'll be opportunities to go long again uh, at, at, at lower rates than we have right now. So that's, that's, that's the overall, um, where it is going to be a, a bump, um, and, but it's a bump that obviously that we and the rating agencies uh, feel that we're in a position to do. So, so I would encourage, um, so, and, I, and I don't disagree, I think the ratings agency thinks, and, and you know, based on the, the uh, audit that we're going to talk about tonight and other uh, information that has been presented about the fiscal uh, strength of the town. I think they do expect that we're okay. Um, I, I, I think the 80s are a cautionary tale for us, and interest rates can certainly go a lot higher, a lot quicker than people expect, um, even into double digits. And if that's the case, we are all in a, a world of trouble. We have bigger problems um, than what we're talking about tonight. But I do think we should be making some plans for extraordinary moves in the debt market and what we will do uh, to either convert or, or not convert uh, under those kind of conditions. You're, you're right. When I said we've not experienced this before, it's not the, what, what we haven't experienced before uh, is, is coming off of a period where there were no interest Like zero rates, interest rates. But right. there was no interest. You yeah. Know? Um, you know, I mean, the historic, you know, the historic averages are, you know, 2% for bond anticipation rate bond anticipation notes and about four percent or, or you know, three eight to, to four point two percent in in bonds um, we're going to spread we're going to surpass that um, but it, but again I think the 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 projections that we believe um, at this point and it, it, it's, we're on track to see see that to, to go above that and then then come back down and how far it come back down no no one really yeah, I, I, I think it would be in our best interest if um, you and our mayor would consider what we would do under extreme circumstances so that we can be prepared 
uh, God forbid, if something like that happens. But I do thank you for your for and, your responses. And, and, and I dare say, I think that we've done that. You know, to be honest with you, I mean, the the decision, you know, now to hold on um, investing in, in the higher rate issues, um, you know, the, the historically, even 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 during the highs, you know, bond anticipation notes have always been better for the taxpayer. Mm. So the, to, to the extent that we're, we're staying with that right now, insulates the taxpayer certainly from, um, from some, some of that potential. But there, there's no perfect answer here. This is, you know, it's a so tough time. There's right? no crystal ball. Right. So. All right. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gross. Thank you. Um, for Ms. Limchick, I do appreciate your consistent advocacy uh, for the Mount Pleasant Forest. Uh, unlike uh, some of my council colleagues, I do believe there is an academic or public use for that space. I think the carriage house um, uh, can serve as a, 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 a space where we uh, work with our local schools um, on, you know, biology or, you know, all of the earth sciences, uh, architecture. I do believe it's a historic space uh, previously owned by uh, General McClellan. Uh, I, I may be wrong, but I do think that's the case, and there's some interesting architecture there as well. Um, but even if we couldn't, uh, the challenges that we're facing with regard to climate change make that um, and other opportunities to preserve old growth forests, uh, well, it should make it a priority for us. Now, I, I will certainly disagree uh, that we, sh we, should, we would have to borrow for that. Um, we wouldn't have to borrow for that if we had just applied for infrastructure money to preserve it. Um, and we could have and may still be able to do that. I don't know if that window has closed, uh, but I, I know that that is something I advocated for and I um, am disappointed that it did not happen. Um, Mr. Meyerwitz, uh, I thank you for your commentary as well. I, I, don't, I think he's still back there. Good to see you. Um, I agree with you, the mayor should attend town council meetings. And um, at our first debate, we talked about adding town council seats uh, by district, or I did, uh, by district and ward. And I think uh, that is a question that the entire community of West Orange should, should answer in the form of a referendum. Um, and if the community believes that it is wise, uh, then I think we should move in that direction. Uh, and certainly do, I do support term limits. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Gibbs, with regard to uh, your questions, uh, I share your concerns uh, and have asked some similar questions myself. Um, I am going to refrain from commenting now because uh, we have two or three issues on the agenda tonight um, that will deal directly with that. Um, but I, I, I do share your concerns. I'm very glad that you've been patient, uh, professional, uh, and persistent um, in highlighting these issues for us. Um, Mrs. Malanga, thank you again for your commentary. Um, I think the workshop on town resilience, uh, that is the first time I've actually been approached with that. I, I, my initial thought is that it's a great idea. Um, certainly we'll continue to take that under advisement and see what, if anything, we can do in that regard. Um, I think Mr. Lepore answered the questions uh, that you posed uh, with the exception of how we arrived at the 200 number. Can you tell us how we arrived at um, 200 in this particular ordinance or this particular project? Um, simply we were looking to plant about 300 trees this year. And uh, simple math, this was the difference. Um, would we like to plant more trees? Absolutely. Uh, sometimes we have trouble finding locations. Uh, we don't want to put a tree in front of somebody's home that doesn't want it because we'd rather find somebody that does and, and is going to nurture uh, that tree, especially during its uh, infancy. So uh, it was really math. It is driven a bit by budget, but certainly uh, we didn't have a capital budget this year yet. Uh, if we do, we can certainly put in more funding for additional tree planting. Thank you, Mr. Laporte. Uh, all right, Ms. Michaela Bennett. Um, the question you asked, is it inappropriate for council members to call a resident's comment disgusting 
if the comment is disgusting, then it is certainly appropriate. Um, just as we are expected to maintain a certain level of decorum um, as council members, I do think it is important uh, that members of the public maintain a certain level of decorum as well. Um, now, as for you asking folks to hold me accountable regarding my personal phone calls and my personal text messages, um, you know, I, I find it um, interesting uh, that you think I care whether or not you believe me. I honestly don't care if you believe that someone called me or texted me or not. I, and those records are mine. They're personal and covered by the law with regard to what I have to turn over and what I don't. Um, now, I know you've threatened to sue me for these. Um, I encourage you to go right ahead. Uh, you've threatened to sue me before, uh, and I have yet to be sued. Um, so if it is in your desire to sue me to see my personal phone calls, God bless you, go right ahead. Uh, with regard to my conduct at the accident on Rock Spring, um, I find it interesting also that you would read a statement from an unnamed resident um, and reference a personal conversation I had um, with residents on that street. Um, first of all, when you initially accused me of impropriety and brought before this council uh, the charge that the council investigate me through your friend Todd DeBovey. Um, at that time, you spoke as if you had already seen the video. And I said in that council meeting, um, I do expect when or if you've already seen it that uh, when you view that video, you will see that I've done nothing wrong. And then I would expect an apology from all of those that have made accusations about me abusing my authority. Now, I know you are in possession of the video, uh, all of the video, and all of the audio from that night. So if you believe I have done something wrong, then please feel free to refer that to whatever investigatory body, every whatever police office or county prosecutor or whomever you think is appropriate. Um, uh, I've seen the video, and so have others. Uh, and so I'm very comfortable, uh, and I was also there personally. Now, as for that conversation I had with the family most directly affected um, by that accident, uh, that conversation was over three hours long. So to insinuate that the only thing I cared about was whether or not they had something to say about my inappropriate behavior uh, could not be further from the, from the truth. Um, what I do think... Um, I think you're disappointed that I won't uh, do what you want me to do. Uh, and I think it's important for us as council members to be comfortable with the actions that we take. Um, I will not bow to pressure from anyone if I do not believe that what they are asking me to do is right. Uh, so, um, you know, I think the rest of the West Orange residents would appreciate that kind of a position from a council member. Uh, because I think that's what we are owed, uh, to what we owe to each other, what we owe to the residents. Um, I think we, we should be able to withstand pressure to, to in either investigate or engage in behaviors that we don't believe are right, uh, even if it creates personal attacks. Uh, that has been my posture uh, and will remain my posture. Uh, and that's the last thing I'll have to say on that. Council President, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Rutherford. Councilman Matu Brown. Thank you, Council President. I, I don't want to keep everyone rehashing all the answers that have been previously given, so I am going to briefly run through um, some of the notes that I made um, to those uh, residents here advocating for the Senior Citizen Advisory. You heard me the last time I was here. I do support it. This administration does not. Nothing will change until the administration changes. So I appreciate your advocacy, but there's nothing that this council can do at this time that's going to change anything. Um, certainly, if elected, I certainly will provide um, the opportunity for an advisory board. Um, 
and it is good use of space over at the Toby Cat Center, but we've been through COVID, so a lot of activity has ceased, um, and certainly look forward to that um, starting up again. But also don't want to discount the programs that we do have, and, and I agree that there is a communication issue, because we have a lot of programming for our senior citizens. There are vaccination um, clinics that are set up, um, and programs that allow nurses to visit our senior citizens. So certainly something that I support, as I stated the last time. Um, Ms. Malanga, I, I did also have a question, but thank you for asking that question as to um, what uh, 200 trees um, were um, going to be planted. How did we come up with that? And I do believe we need an assessment, and I'm glad that uh, Mr. Lepore was here to make reference to that comment. Um, that you had. Mr. Kukorbiak, I think that your questions were already answered by um, Mr. Gross, so thank you, Mr. Gross, for that. I won't um, say anything further on that, except to say I think it's really, you do the, the public a disservice when you tell them things like secret meetings. As you know well, having sat on this dais for 10 years, that Executive sessions aren't secret sessions, but permissible, because there is negotiations that the municipality has to discuss, sometimes lawsuits, sometimes personnel, and those things are not open to the public. So please stop calling them secret. They're not secret. They're executive. You actually were part of a lawsuit that lasted um, um, almost 20 years, and you were on there representing as a council liaison, and you were not able to speak about anything that happened in executive session until that case was concluded a couple years ago. So I know that you know that. It's not fair that you trick people by saying secret. It's not a secret. It's a process. Um, I do appreciate um, Mr. Gibbs um, attending again. We are going to discuss cannabis later, so I'm not going to take the time to um, respond to your um, questions, but I do want to say that it's not, it was never just a matter of having a location in too much uh, proximity. The task force did look at your application and did not like the location itself, but we'll discuss that um, when we're discussing the cannabis applications. Um, with respect to Ms. Bennett, your comment about, I think your question was, is it appropriate to call a resident or public comment, comment, commenter, comments um, distasteful, disgusting? I, I don't believe so. I know we are elected officials. We have assumed a role, um, and, and part of that role comes with public criticism. I've had conversations with you where I felt that for the last four years, you kicked my back in often in public. But I never said anything distasteful to you because you are my constituent. You are someone that I have to respond to because I ask for your trust by your vote and in this seat. So yeah, I don't agree that any council member should call a member disgusting. If there is hateful language um, that, that, that attacks the public, very different. Anti-Semitic language, um, any, any hatred language, um, that form, I would call it out. But, you know, when you're criticizing one of us and haven't been the, the star of your criticism for the last four years, I've never come back to you and, and disparaged you in public. I may challenge you, but I don't disparage you in public. Um, I do agree that um, the Oprah request, and I did respond to the administration asking questions with respect to the validity of denying an Oprah request because I do not want us to set, set ourselves up for yet another Oprah lawsuit, which you have, unfortunately, in the past sued um, on before, as have other residents. And if it's a matter of a statement that you want proven, and if it's a matter of personal um, information, that's different. But when you represent as an elected official and make that public statement and someone is requesting an Oprah, um, it should be followed. That's my opinion. I don't, I don't know where this council is with respect to supporting um, and ensuring that we all abide by the oath that we've taken, but that is a discussion that this council should have. Um, 
I think that's all I have in response to the public comments that were made. Thank you, Council Thank President. Thank you. Councilwoman Castellino. Thank you, Council President. So let's start with Ms. Bennett. Ms. Bennett, first of all, to get the record straight, I apologize if I said that you were disgusting because I don't recall that. I didn't even recall even mentioning your name. I believe I recalled something that was said in regard to some comments to my council colleague, not even to myself. I have the thickest skin of many people that I know. Um, I've never commented against you, even when you attack my son-in-law on Facebook. I stay clearly away from the nonsense. But that evening, it disturbed me that my colleague was getting attacked in a way that I thought was disgusting. So again, I'll use that phrase. Most people like to use the word deplorable. I'm sorry, the house I grew up in, the word disgust comes to mind. In regards to my colleague going, responding to a resident to go to the scene, I see no issue with it. I know I have times uh, I've, I've been on hand. That's part of your role as a council person. When something horrible happens in this community that we love and we serve, you just go. You know, I think the last meeting I talked about COVID when we, you know, we, we, I left my home. The mayor told us to stay home and, and we went to serve food to our seniors. So there's things we sometimes do that maybe we should think twice about, but it comes from the heart and it comes from caring about our community. And, and I, felt, I felt for my colleague that evening, so I'm, I'm not apologizing for that. Okay, our seniors, thank you so much for coming this evening, coming down, all the public comments in regards to our seniors. Um, Sheila, it was great to see you this evening. It's been years. I can't believe we're rising seniors ourselves. It was just yesterday, uh, the boys were on the football field, so it's great to see you. Um, communication, we are approved upon in the past years. Um, I asked Mr. Fagan to pass around a sheet. So anybody here, if we have a newsletter with all the programming. So Ms. Van Dyke, she gets that communication out. Um, it comes out maybe a couple times a week with all the programming where it's located and where you could go. So the one thing we want is for our seniors to communicate with each other, to see each other. In fact, when we were in the dire months of COVID, we um, set up uh, Zoom classes where we taught our seniors how to go online and walk them through uh, to go on Zoom just so you, you, know, you, you could speak to one another because you needed that personal contact, you needed that outreach with each other. So, you know, these great ideas, we were recognized by ARP, my colleague uh, mentioned ARP certified. Well, we are, West Orange, our Aging Well West Orange program is an ARP certified program. And we're really proud and excited about that. And, you know, we, we've just been striving. If anybody has Dr. Dorfs, I know she had left. If they have her information, we could put her on here so we could sign her up for the newsletter. Um, also, the downtown mobile app, uh, which is townwide app, you could just scan this with your phone, take a picture, and it will download to your phone. So before you leave this evening, we're uh, working on one of the icons to be directly straight to the senior services department. A um, few things have to be uploaded on it, but in the meantime, a lot of the programs and activities in town are on here. So we're always trying, we're always striving. And I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna stick up for the mayor because the mayor, I know it was a, you know, he wasn't supportive of the advisory board and I said at the last meeting and the fact of the matter is these advisory boards, and I know because Mr. Mr. Fagan serves on the uh, Public Relations Commission and there's activities that he has to do for us and he has to come to the meeting. So, you know, the mayor didn't have the staffing in place and that was one of the reasons he didn't want to overburden the department. And so, you know, whether or not anybody agrees or disagrees with it, 
um, it's, he still supported everything we did. All the grants we applied for, uh, lending out personnel to all the extended programming and budgeting for items. So, um, you know, primetime players is out there. We have community groups, Pleasantdale Seniors. Um, Council President mentioned the town pool. We have programming in the summer. Uh, our homebound seniors, which are, are you know, our most vulnerable. Um, so if anyone out there is listening to this, um, please call Ms. Van Dyke. Uh, uh, 973-325-4105 and, and get that person's name to them. There's a list. So we've been expanding lists. We've been expanding the communication. This is so, so important. I thank all of you for coming and speaking passionately tonight because it is important and uh, we will continue the work. So, um, you know, that's all the information I'm going to share on that for now, and I'm always available to, to talk to you because there's just so much I could go on and on for the sake of time. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Gibbs and Mr. Gibbs, first of all, thank you for your service and for what you do, and that is why you have so much patience with us, and I really appreciate it. We'll talk about that a little, little later when we get to the resolutions because we do have the three resolutions, and I appreciate your passion, and, and again, empathize with you because it, it is a big investment for you and um, and and again I, I'm not going to apologize to you know as far as like being picky with the locations because you know that's our duty to our, our residents but um, we'll get to that but but thank you and um, Mr. Gross thank you for the work and my colleague for asking all those questions I know when we get to um, debt and paying it off, paying it down. I, I try to remind folks, you know, you all have to make a decision when the interest rates were rising, you know, do you refinance your home? Um, you know, do you, you extend your equity line? So, you know, this is no different here at, at the township and making those decisions. And uh, we always work on paying our debt down. Um, I know Rock Spring, again, so important as we move forward the begin uh, next year. Uh, working on a plan to finalize that Green Acres grant that will um, that will pay um, pay the uh, debt off, and um, you know we'll move forward to that. And I wasn't going to say, but I, I, I have to say it too to my uh, my former colleague. <laughs> I know you're smiling back there, and we always went back and forth about the debt and whatnot. And I appreciate that, and, and for what you do advocating uh, for the community, but. You know, in regards to the secret meeting, and I have to echo my, co my colleagues' comments. I wasn't going to, but it, it, it's frustrating. It's frustrating because we work really hard up here, and you did too when you were here. And, um, you know, we go in closed session. The school board does it every, every meeting they have. They have closed session because, unlike us, they get, discuss, get to discuss personnel. So um, they start their meetings, their public meetings at 8. They're there at 6.30 uh, talking about whatever personnel items they have because they can't discuss that in public. And no one is ever accusing them of having secret meetings. So um, again, that's part of our job. That's part of what we have to do. I have thick skin. Doesn't bother me when things are said of that nature. But I feel bad for the audience this evening that um, they have to keep hearing this over and over again. But again, if you have questions, just please call us. We're more than glad to answer them for you. And in regards to the TV 36, I did fail to mention earlier that I had a, a school board liaison meeting last week with Dr. Schoen and two of our school board members, uh, which was great to catch up with them. They have a lot going on with the new implementation, the new uh, preschool program. And uh, we did, and I'll mention it later, we had a discussion about um, the cannabis and and um, you know the uh, you know kids vaping and and educational materials. We'll discuss that later. Um, but in regards to TV 36, you know they they've been working on it. And I know if you sign up for the newsletter, Miss Van Dyke has been sending out the link to the YouTube as part of the newsletter. So if you are signed up for the newsletter, um, pay attention to, to it and to her emails because um, she has the link for the council meetings on that. So where you may not get it 
on uh, TV 36, you'll be able to get it uh, on the computer. Thank you, Ms. Uh, uh, Council President. Uh, thank you, Councilman Castellino. Mr. Rutherford, yes. I just, for the record, would like to read something into the record regarding Councilwoman Matute Brown's last comment about uh, somehow me being inappropriately withholding records. If that's all right, it'll take maybe a minute. When an open request involves private, and this is all included in my email responses to this Oprah. When an OPRA request involves private information, the public agency must consider the seven factors set forth in Burnett versus County of Bergen. One, the type of record requested. Two, the information it does or might contain. Three, the potential for harm in any subsequent non-consensual disclosure. Four, the injury from disclosure to the relationship in which the record was generated. Five, the adequacy of safeguards to prevent unauthorized disclosure. Six, the degree of need for access. And seven, whether there is an express statutory mandate, articulated public policy, or other recognized public interest militating toward access. The appellate division found that all seven factors weighed in favor of non-disclosure. The court continued that the personal information does not relate to the core concern of OPRA, which is public access to government records. Moreover, the court noted that the OPRA request form did not put citizens on notice that their personal information could be subject to disclosure or advise that citizens can submit a request anonymously. With regard to the plaintiff's contention, contention that he was entitled to disclosure of the requested private information pursuant to the common law right of access, the appellate division also found that privacy interests outweighed the plaintiff's right to access. When analyzing whether privacy concerns outweigh a common law right to access, courts utilize the balancing factors set forth in Ketty versus Rutgers. One, the records must be common law public documents. Two, the person seeking access must establish an interest in the subject matter of the material. And three, the citizen's right to access must be balanced against the state's interest in preventing disclosure. Based on the law, I am entitled to my personal records and those that contact me personally from the public should feel comfortable that I will not turn over a, a personal record unless there is a public interest. In this case, there is not. Thank you, Council President. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, Madam Clerk. <clears throat> All right, we're gonna review the consent agenda. Um, before you start, sure. I just wanna let you know, I think I did let you know actually, but you I'm did. gonna make it a record here yeah. that the, the executive session is not gonna be had tonight because there's nothing further to report. Mr. Beckelman's not here. Um, we'll probably have something on at the next meeting, but we'll take it a meeting at a time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kayser. Thank you to the public who is exiting. We appreciate you coming out this evening. Good night, all. Stay Good safe. Night. Okay. Um, approval of minutes of previous meeting, October 11th, 2022, Consent. public meeting. Consent. Consent. Report of township officers, none. Reading of petitions and communications and bids, none. Bills, are there any questions on the bills? Consent. Consent. Resolutions, are any resolutions being pulled this evening? Councilwoman Kesslinger. Well, I don't want to pull it, but I asked, uh, had asked, requested Mr. Laporte to come in and talk about safe routes to school. Um, what was the other grant, Mr. Laporte? There was one other There's one. a DEP grant. Yeah, so if he could if he could just speak first and talk about all the grants um, this evening, I thought that would be great information uh, for the community. Um, I was excited about the safe routes to schools. Um, he's going to give us a, a breakdown of the schools and how uh, and how you determined each each uh, school. This is resolution two sixty four. Um, this actually this resolution is some housekeeping uh, we already do have the grant for approximately 50 uh, solar-powered flashing yeah. school crossing signs 
Um, I do not have the list in front of me. If you want the specific schools, I can go get the list. I, I, just, just I, I have it. You have them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we, we looked at locations where we thought that they would be very appropriate. Uh, given the limitations where we thought we would be in approximately a three-quarter to a million dollar grant, um, that's, that's how we came up with the number of signs. So we looked at where we have school crossing guards and wanted to make those crossings safer. And what about uh, the timeline for implementation? Um, that is going to depend on the funding from, uh, from the federal government as it moves through uh, the local aid office in Newark. So I do not have a, a timeline on that, but I would not expect anything prior to the next 12 to 18 months. So, Mr. Lepore, will that also, I know we had a meeting on the corner of Gregory and Ludington only a few weeks ago. Would that, could this apply to what was being pr proposed um, there? It, we, we hadn't looked at that because um, I, I think of those more as pedestrian crossings, not exclusively school okay. crossings. Um, but the kids are crossing to get to right, Gregory. Well, well, there could be signs there, but they, they may be more of a pedestrian crossing sign than specifically a school. So, and, and we also tried to limit it to where we have crossing guards that would operate um, these signs. So, um, it, mm. it was more concentrated on certain schools, certain locations where we have crossing guards. Okay. And again, this is, this is a housekeeping matter that says we're agreeing to, to follow uh, certain guidelines of the federal grant. Um, if you recall, we also have a federal grant for Washington Street mm -hmm. under the Transportation Alternative Program. Same protocols had to be followed, need to have certain training, uh, and able to proceed with that grant. Same thing here. Okay. And that's what this is acknowledging. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rutherford, did you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you. Is, so this is only for the crosswalks, correct? Correct. Can, uh, we've got some issues on Walker Road. Um, coming up from South Valley toward Gregory with regard to speeding um, in the after school hours. Can any of this grant be used to highlight uh, the school zone speed limit in that um, corridor? I, I don't think at this point we can use that the grant for this because it was specific with what we asked for and what we're finding out even with the transportation alternative program if we want to tweak something can't we tweak probably it. can't tweak it uh, we, they, we need to be very specific with what we request, but that doesn't mean we can't, through our own budget, look at um, how to make uh, lower speeds or make uh, crossings safer there. <coughs> but Mr. Uh, Lepore, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please do, because the Walker Road after school hours, especially those folks coming downhill, mm -hmm. uh, they frequently exceed the speed limit, and uh, you know we, we've got a bunch of kids coming down the hill. Wal Walker Road has uh, become a, a topic lately. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it is. But so to Mr. Rutherford's point, though, Len, I know you don't have an agenda right in front of you, but uh, Resolution 265 is an approval to submit a grant application with the DOT for Walker Road, South Valley Road, and Rooney Circle improvements. Yeah, that, that's part of a, a new program from the local aid office in the Department of Transportation. This isn't exactly municipal aid money. It's, it's another funding source. And we're applying for it. We think we're going to be very successful. Um, predominantly looked at that as a, as a milling and, and resurfacing. But uh, we can certainly uh, incorporate other improvements in, into that. Mm -hmm. That would address the but issues But I think it's something probably sooner than later we need to look at there uh, on Walker Road. So, so we may still wait for this grant, but not necessarily wait for the grant to, right. to make some safety improvements. It's even better. Council President, I had um, on that same resolution. Mm -hmm. it, can you talk about what improvements for Rooney Circle this would cover? I was back there today doing a PRC test, and that entire parking lot is tore up. Um, would that apply? Is that what we're looking? No, this is this is for Rooney Circle itself. The actual circle. The actual circle, circle okay. itself. Nothing to do with the, the property we acquired. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And then 273 also with the storm warner trains. You, did you have a question about that? Well, I just yeah. want him to explain it. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, we uh, recently uh, completed the project to put uh, golf cart paths uh, at Rock Spring Club. 
Um, that increased some of the uh, impervious coverage, although it is a very large piece of property. Relatively speaking, it wasn't a lot, but we still want to mitigate uh, some of the additional stormwater flow as a result of, of the cart paths, and this is a grant that will help us design and, and construct those rain, rain gardens. And can you attest to the fact that we are not constructing a building there, that there isn't any plans? Because I think the recent construction of the paths and the cleaning up of the property, which has been a benefit, folks in the neighborhood were getting nervous that there was plans okay. underway that uh, were not approved. Okay, no, no buildings are being constructed. Um, if you see some recent trucks, it's associated with road construction on Undercliff Terrace South as well as uh, within the next week, Knollwood Drive. Great. And, and I can say with, that with a high level of definity, there, there's nothing, nothing planned, nothing <laughs> happening, and uh, not even a contemplation uh, be, be, be beyond uh, whatever anybody might be thinking. You know, and yeah, I, we're but not getting nothing. rid of the 18 uh, hole golf course no. anytime soon. And as a golfer who played there fairly recently, they did a pretty good job with the <laughs> cart path installation, I thought. So. So, so the cart path installation is all completed? It's, it's all, com all completed. Okay. Yeah. Um, may go back and fine tune some things that the uh, club has asked about, but uh, pretty much everything that we designed has, has been constructed. Great to hear. So just to make sure the public is clear, the commentary recently uh, regarding the construction, that's about the quarry that is behind Rock Spring Golf Club yeah. and, and the um, statements that were made that there is no plan to do any building there and, and, and it's being done primarily to accommodate this car path construction and, and well, then again for road for storage just of to equipment. To be clear, there's no construction going on there. There was the, the area being plan. used as a stick. Previously or in the future, there's no no plans to do anything there. The work that you, the work, and I'll put that in quotes that you're seeing there, is part of contractors doing working on other projects in town that we've allowed them to use that as a staging area. And you know it's important to have places like that where you can do work that's not on the roadway when they put their trucks and things of that nature. And one of our vendors did a really nice job of cleaning up after they were done. Mm -hmm. And uh, we appreciate, we're appreciative of that, um, but um, we don't want that to be confused uh, with any concept that somehow or another we're preparing for or about to enter into any other phase of construction there. That's just not the case. I, I do want to take a, a moment of personal privilege. Mr. Gross knows that I have uh, sure to harass him with pictures via text and email and I do that because obviously I have received concerns from neighbors that are in that area. And I will publicly say, since the mayor saw my post this weekend, um, was not at all pleased. And I told him I wasn't satisfied with the answer because I saw everything that was going on there. But I am very happy at this time to understand and really hear a public comment that says we're not doing anything. So, uh, Mr. Gross, thank you for your patience and my apologies for your my, my tantamount harassment of you for inquiry of that space. I, I, I never considered it. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm good on that. Thank, thank you, Mr. LaCour. Council President, I had, I had questions, not, nothing to pull. You know, can, can we address any questions to Mr. LaCour so he does not have to sit through the rest of this mm -hmm. meeting? If anyone has any uh -uh. questions not directly for Lenny? No, this isn't for yeah, I'm all good. I'm good. Thank okay. you, Mr. LaCour. Yeah, I'm satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> he's having fun. He's staying. He doesn't want to go. He's resting. <laughs> All right. Uh, Councilman, any more questions? Uh, I am going to pull. I know uh, my colleague's probably going to, well, I guess not pull, but talk about. But I am going to pull the ordinance because I'm going to ask for an amendment to which one? Um, Uh, 28522, the suspending of the acceptance of the application. 285, you're pulling that one. Two, I'm pulling that one because I'm yeah. going to ask for an amendment to it. Thank you. Councilman, do you have any um, anything, questions? Yeah, I do have, a qu I have two questions, actually. Um, no, actually one because this one was already responded to. Um, 
And so with, I wanted to discuss um, resolution 287, which is a second amendment to the agreement of sale purchase for the portion of block 68, lot one. And for um, those who do not have the agenda in front of you, that resolution is specific to the site of the current library. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Kai, who, who can speak to that? Um, I can speak to it briefly, but also uh, Mr. William Sullivan is here. He represents Albert. And, and he's here and he can also talk about it. That would be great. That's why he looked familiar. How are mm -hmm. you? <laughs> Good to see you again. Good evening. Please. Thank you. Can we talk about it now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to pull it because I'm not, I'm not voting up. against it. I, I just wanted to talk, talk about it when it was arrived at. Next, but, next but, time we'll have the spotlight. Joe, <laughs> Joe, Joe. We'll figure it out. I mean, basically, as, as I understand it, and, and, and Mr. Sullivan can confirm this, um, the concern uh, is on the part of investors who want to make sure they get the benefit of the 9% rate that was negotiated by Mr. Alpert in connection with this um, project. Uh, and it has a deadline, I think, of December 31st, 2024. 20. And they want to make sure there's enough time to get it built um, before then, because if they don't get it built before then, they'll lose that benefit. And since it's important for the investors to feel comfortable about their investment, um, they want to make sure that they can start on time. So that the a time of the essence closing was made for March 31st, I believe, 2023, yeah. which should give them enough time. Um, and... I think there were also some, I, I think there are limits on what the damages are if, if the time of the essence clause isn't met. Um, and and uh, Bill can talk about that, I think, as well. You, thank yeah. you so much. And thank you for joining us. Good evening, Mr. Sullivan. He has the mic. It's a hand oh, tonight. Thank you. Yeah, William Sullivan, Scrincy Hollenbeck, on behalf of uh, Mr. Alpert, in this case, the West Orange Senior Housing LLC. Uh, I, Ken has described it pretty well. Um, we, uh, this, this project is, is dependent, its viability is dependent upon 9% low income housing tax credits. Uh, and the, the way that works, is, as you probably know, is that you have in, in investors that, that put money in it and then take advantage of the credit when it's done. Um, those credits expire in December 2024. Um, and so while uh, we've you know, negotiated uh, the purchase and sale agreement, uh, originally was signed in April of this year. Um, and we did one other amendment uh, a couple of months ago, but we, the investors want some comfort level that we're going to actually be able to have this finished and open uh, by the time that the credits expire. Otherwise, we're all in a lot of trouble. Right? And so if you work back from that date of December 2024, um, 14 to 16 months to construct the project, uh, and then with some, you know, some cushion and wiggle room involved, you end, you end up back in you know, maybe... Uh, April of next year with taking permits and therefore we want to close by March of 31st of, of next year. And so uh, this is this is not, I don't think you should interpret this as some sort of aggressive act on our part. Uh, you know, sometimes when you're in real estate deals, you know, everybody gets a time of the essence letter and everybody gets nervous. It's it's not like that. It's that we, we, we're all confident, the administration is confident, we're confident we can close by that date. Uh, we just need a date in there so that we're all knowing going forward that we are going to close by that date, and then we can start our project immediately after that and be ready in time and open in time so that we can uh, get our tax credits. Okay. Thank you. Councilwoman Kesslina. Thank and you. I just want to add to that conversation because as I uh, stated earlier this evening, uh, I had met with the, um, our friends group in the library last Monday night, and uh, they're on it. Uh, I mean, Mr. QB, he has a mover planned uh, to move up there. The friends are volunteering all their time, packing up all, like, have you ever been to the book sale and all those books that are in the, the basement of the building? That's a lot of books there. And uh, I have to commend them. It's a monumental task. Uh, anyone has time to volunteer, reach out to them. Um, but they, um, they have a great plan, and uh, they're, they're working it. So... 
Everybody is understanding of the timeline. Everybody is committed. They, a lot of planning has gone into this. It's very impressive. And um, yeah, they're, they're excited for it. Um, and I understand the plan is too, that the older part, the part closest to this building, is not being demolished. So the plan, as I understand yeah. it, is to take a lot of the stuff and just move it over into the old portion so that we can demolish the, the newer portion on yep. the western side. So the, the administration has been working very closely with the developer and with the contractor, yeah. uh, and we've approached this from the very beginning to understand that we're going to be under a, a, a very specific timeline, uh, and we feel very uh, positive about meeting that this, this date. Uh, I've assigned a, a project manager who basically is walking, talking, and living uh, this project as soon, making sure that, uh, that uh, the, there, there's no unforeseen obstacles or, the, or when, they do, when the unforeseen obstacles do come up uh, that we figure out how to get around them, through yeah. them, and over them uh, so that we're not, we're not getting delays. And, it's, and so far, it's been working very well. Um, so we're, we're, we're very pleased with the progress of the project. Uh, we feel confident that um, the, the, the timelines are doable. Um, we have uh, and have we haven't executed them yet, but we, we have begun the process of planning what ifs if if we do run into yeah. uh, some types of delay. So we're going to be prepared for the, any eventuality, and uh, we'll, we'll meet this deadline. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, not being told? Yeah. Great. Are there any other? Any other questions, Councilwoman? Um, and the only question I had, um, not to pull, but just an inquiry regarding 270-22. Um, that is a change order number three for the improvements to Curtis Avenue and Barfield Avenue project mm -hmm. with A and J general contractors. Um, my question and, and oh, my, my, my councilwoman. Uh, thank you. Um, regarding 270 22, uh, change order number three for MA 2016 improvements to Curtis Avenue and Garfield Avenue project. Um, my question is, and I know we have discussed change orders and, and how sometimes they cannot um, be avoided. But I just wanted to ask if the administration is going back and reviewing. Um, when we have our change orders and the final amount that we're paying, if we're also looking at that next bid or going back to review those bids to see how close or far um, we end up being paying to what that next viable bid could have been. I'm just wondering if we're looking at that in any way um, and if we can start taking that into consideration. Maybe it'll help alleviate some of the change orders or, I mean, maybe it may be just me needing to understand, are we obligated to always go with the lowest bid? Um, I know sometimes we get information that says they've done good work for us in the past. We've been pleased with it. Um, is that also justification for us to always go with the lowest that, bidder? We're, that, we're, that's we're, pretty much anecdotal. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're always, we always have to go with the lowest responsible bidder. If there was a history, I think, of a bidder consistently, you know, not bidding correctly, maybe that could be taken into consideration. And I, I'm no expert on the local public contract. So there, there, there is a process to disqualify uh, bidders, but it has to be based on your own experience, yeah. uh, not, not, not another entity's experience. And you have to preclude them before the bidding process even starts. There, so by the time you get to that. There is a provision of a local public contracts law, which allows um, a contracting entity to basically disqualify potential bidders for what's called prior ne negative experience. Um, there's a sort of a sort of examples and things that we can do, but um, if we ever run into that situation, I'll, you know, we can go formally into what the procedure would be. But it would, it would involve a hearing as well, right. where the, the council can basically say, we don't want you ever come back again. Just, um, just, just another opportunity for us to just you know look back and reflect on where we've been and where we intend to go. Um, you know, obviously, I, I, I'm not opposed to change orders. I understand that things do happen, um, but certainly, I just want us to to look at the the initial process and and those companies that just do come back continuously. <laughs> the, the, this particular one is for two hundred ninety one dollars and fifty seven cents. Exactly. It's so the it's not a big deal. And 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 while this is not <laughs> technically this this is technically something other than 
the, than a, um, an as-built. This is pretty much an as-built. You won't see this again, uh, I believe, correct, Mr. Lepore? We, this contract is, is uh, be done, right? This, this contract is done. Yeah. Um, if I might just embellish a little bit. Uh, the contractor isn't asking for this money. Uh, unfortunately, this is a state grant project, and the state is looking to see why we didn't make a certain adjustment, uh, which is allowed under the law. So if we don't pay the contractor this, what is it, 200 some odd dollars? We do not get our 200 something thousand dollars. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to pass the change order. That's not my issue. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely but the answer is, look, look ch change, order, change orders are our nemesis. Um, I, as I've told you before, we're so on this library project and so about keeping our timeline that, that we're making, you're going to see a lot of change orders there because, number one, because we promised you that's how we would do it. Um, and number two, uh, w instead of collecting them up, uh, as you might do in another, another job, we're, we're going to bring them as, as they occur. Um, it's it, it it it's it's a hard walk to walk because the bottom line is most of the time you have to do the work and it's some omission or some something they didn't see or an omission on on behalf of another professional uh, that causes us to be in the situation where we are and frankly I've been through the process of litigating these types of things and they go nowhere um, you, know, you just end up spending legal fees on, on, for the most part, spending as much money as you're as you're probably spending, and certainly as much as you, more than you would save. Um, having said all that, we, we're 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 committed to um, doing it differently, as we spoke before re earlier in the year, uh, to doing it differently than, than we've done it in the past. And you, like I said, you're going to see you're going to see a lot more of them, but they're going to be done ahead of time before the the work's actually done, for the most part. Uh, there may be few exceptions to that, um, but we're we're working hard. If, if you're you're no different than any other municipality or any other municipal body. No one likes change orders, and unfortunately, it's just part of the terrain. So I appreciate that, but I think what the councilman is getting at is: Are we capturing the data? Do we have data regarding past performance showing? what the final cost was versus the bid cost and how far that deviates sure. so that we can use that before we Absolutely. accept bids. Okay. Yeah, we have we have all that. All all of our all of our every change order mm -hmm. is a documentation of the up to the total. It's not like it's a, a separate thing hanging out there. So at the end of the day, at the end we always know exactly what that project costs. And then you can go by vendor and say this vendor generally comes five percent, ten percent, one percent. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see yeah. that and you can't change. use that. Right. But I you can't, can't use it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's your personal experience, right? Like that's no, 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 by law. You can't use it. You, you, have, to, you have to exclude them up front. Right. That's right. what I'm saying. So if we know that information up front, if a, if a vendor consistently you know, bids at change X order, price. Change order would not, be, would not qualify that. That's not. Hmm. A change order, you've, think about it. You've agreed to pay them. You, you, so you, that's interesting. So, so, so the law actually allows vendors to bid at a certain price and then submit multiple change orders, which could be 10, 20, 30 percent above the original bid. Is that no, they, have I, just, I, they have to be justified. But remember, the, the justification of that, you know, there's a lot of things at play. You have other professionals that do the design. You have other professionals that are doing the administration. So there's, there's a lot of other factors involved. And you know the the vendors the, the the contractors are advocating on behalf of them and and we're advocating on behalf of ourselves and the, and we hire these other professionals to do the work and sometimes they find a flaw sometimes they just like when you know when you open up a wall in your house you find something you weren't anticipating these things happen right and, but and if a vendor consistently does that and it's egregious I'm not saying it's but, five percent you, you had it you. How do you how do you blame at the time the vendor? If you're blaming the vendor, you're not going to pay them, right? If if you come to me as a vendor and it's your fault, I'm not going to pay you. I'm, we're going to get in dispute and we're going to we're going to talk about that you know all through the project. If I ended up paying you, it's not your fault. You, that's his case. Why did you pay me if it was my fault? So it's just not a, it's not a criteria you can use for this. That's very interesting. 
All right. Um, I'm going to continue to think about that. I, I understand what the councilwoman is getting at and share her concerns. Um, you know, I, th I think, you know, we, we have to take the lowest responsible bidder. I would expect that if bidders were consistently um, coming in with an exorbitant number of change orders or an exorbitant amount above the initial bid, that would, to me, mean they're not responsibly bidding. And then we could preclude them from the vendor pool or the bidder pool. Um, or at least I would like to be able to, but what I'm hearing you say is that that particular criteria is not eligible to be used to preclude someone from the bidder pool. So, so one, um, there is a limitation as to the percentage of the contract price that is subject to change order. I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head. Yeah, you, well, it's, oh. it, there's, there's a limit of 20% before you have to advertise and notify the right. public that you did it. Right. It doesn't limit you to, right. you, you, it doesn't limit the amount. It's just a notification to, to, the, to the public that a contract went over 20%. And the other thing is, um, a, a lot of times, it's also, you know, the idea of a change order being, it's not always the fault of the vendor. That's the other thing. So it's kind of like to say they have a lot of change orders. Yes, there are vendors that are bad at sort of projecting out projects and things like that, but that's why when you, we ha whenever you guys have a change order, the first thing you ask is, Letty, why are we having this change order? And then you guys can understand that, is it something that was truly unforeseen or was it something that, you know, they kind of messed up on? So that's sort of the mechanism mm -hmm. for, for the town to sort of respond. Um, but the, this idea of using like a percentage of change orders, like if they have multiple change orders, you, you can't really use that because sometimes it's, you know, again, the, the specifications were drafted poorly, and there was a bunch of things that no one knew about, or there were things that the town didn't mention, or things like that. So it can't always be placed on the vendors. So that's why they, they didn't use that as a specific criteria for us to be able to disqualify uh, a vendor. Um, that being said, you know I don't know what the data is. Yeah. What the I mean, in my career, I, and, and I, I've been in numerous in cases of litigation uh, over, yeah. over some of this stuff. And um, Often it ends up becoming a dispute between your 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 design professionals and and the contractor, and you get, so you get into that that type of thing. So it, it's then the question is, you know, it's not your fault. We know so we're the customer. It's not our fault, but it, it might be our agent's fault. So and and so the, that that kind of stuff goes on a lot. What, what has helped us in, that that I found and what we're doing now is putting a project manager on so that when these dis little disputes come up, there's somebody else there there's a, yeah. you know, that says, that makes a determination, okay, who is it? Because if you wait till the end, it's, you've got this laundry list of things that, that, that the professionals say is wrong and the laundry list of things that the contractor says that it was the professional's fault and, and you never, you never mm -hmm. melt through it because it's just too much to do. So by putting a project manager on it and, and really staying on top of it, it helps. So would you, you please forward to me the um, law on that? You, you referenced contracts law saying, you know, you, you uh, Mr. Gross, referenced that there's a uh, requirement to advertise to the public when it goes over a 20% threshold. Um, and then there's a series of criteria that we are allowed to use to preclude uh, folks from bidding. I'd like to know what that is as well. It, it, specifically the negative prior experience? Well, whatever, because to me, negative prior experience is we went 20% over the initial bid with change orders. Now, I don't know what the law says a negative well, prior you've experience is. process. You've got to prove that whatever it is that went wrong, you have to prove who made it So wrong. there's no, no list. They don't list some things that are includable in that analysis and some things that are not? Essentially, it's, it's, if they defaulted, they breached, if they missed deadlines and things like that if they've deviated from specifically what they're required to do under the contracts. Now, change order is a little bit different because, as Mr. Gross said, a change order is them coming to you and saying, hey, listen, can we adjust the price? And you guys either say yes or you guys say no. So if you guys say yes, you will issue the change order, then they're not really in default of the agreement. So... But sometimes, like, like we had one earlier this year for water fountains, for example. You can't have a library without... Water fountains. So how do we say no to that? Like, we can't say no to that. Well, you could. Wow. Well, I mean, well, but then no, you have a library with no... Could. But you could. Right. And you that's certainly a, not a contractor problem to the extent that was... That was no, that wasn't a contractor, that but that was an architect. Yeah. That was an architect. Yeah. yeah. So, 
So I'd like to know like when those kinds of things come up, how do we capture that data? And that's really the, the, what I'm getting at. And I think that's what the councilwoman's getting at. We want to be more informed when these change orders are presented to us so that we have an understanding of whether or not this is a habitual practice, if it is normal, if it's customary, uh, if it is something that's done by one bidder more often than another, um, so that we can make some more informed decisions. I think it's yeah. fair to say that you're more informed on this library project than you, than, than you probably But just in general, not just the library. And, no, no. Well, my yeah. point is that's, that's a change, and that, that's, that's what we're, we've committed to come back to you and, and, and bring those things to you so you will be more informed about what's actually going on at these levels. Because you're right, because when you wait to the end, it all gets, it, it's, it's in a bag. You know, these are, this, we've got this set of problems and this set of problems, and it's hard to, to run through. If you're committed, and I, and I know you are, to, to go through this, this dialogue every time we have um, these minor changes, we're going to do that. We're, we'll be better off because we're we're managing it much more at a micro level, and you'll you'll feel like you're getting the real story. So you'll know whether or not the, 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 what what's happening is justified or not. So thank you, gentlemen. I you think we beat that one up. Yeah, I do. I, but I wanted to thank Lenny too because anytime there is a change order, there is always a detailed explanation on what is happening and why it's happening. It sounds like you're asking for more of a historical perspective mm -hmm. on what's happening. I'm sorry, yes. And I, and I just want to comment, too, that, you know, it, how long has Ayubet been with us now? You, that, since we've, nine you've, months. you finally got an assistant <laughs> to <laughs> nine months. So there's a big difference now that there's more manpower. However, I know I'm in panic mode. When are you retiring again? <laughs> so, so was, you know, we seem very caught up. So, you know, Mr. Gross, we're looking forward to that plan of succession and how we move forward because, uh, you, know, you know, we're seeing, you know, that we have been caught up and, and whatnot. And uh, that, we, don't, we, don't plan, want, we don't want to go backwards. That plan is, in, is, is well in development. Okay. We have, we're going to call you uh, from wherever you're, you're going to be at, right? <laughs> That's a condition of his retirement. <laughs> Council President, um, yes. I actually am going to pull um, okay. resolution a resolution 284. 284. Okay. And I wanted to just say on resolution 271, I look forward to welcoming a new uh, forester as a tree care ex expert for the town. And I also wanted to just comment on resolution 282 about designating Dominic Allegrino as our OEM coordinator. So, 280, what? A 280. Oh, okay. oh, I'm sorry, 280-22. But 280 just, um, we and Susan Iovino actually, just to commend Susan as well as yeah. public health nurse, because we have never, well, and our police and fire and really all of our other departments, because we never experienced anything as we did with this yeah. pandemic. And they never saw that, and they navigated through it for all of us. And uh, I, I couldn't agree with you yeah. more, yeah. Okay. Uh, Council President. It was on. Uh, I, I actually had two resolutions I wanted to talk about tonight, and that was one of them. Just mm -hmm. to um, the 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 dedication, and you know, the three three years ago, uh, when when Nick was appointed. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, every uh, he thought everybody <laughs> thought this was like going to be Cake you know walk. a typical yeah, yeah. well no it's not I mean there's you know there's work to do there's you yeah. know right. the, the but job. he has been involved in so and, and, long yeah. in so many different of levels uh, um, but it ended up becoming mm -hmm. um, just so much more so all involved and in fact you know I I want to thank him and frankly I want to thank his family yeah. Um, yeah. you know for for uh, Allowing him mm -hmm. to to help us through and guide us through what was for all of us, you know, one of, one of the major events in our lives. So I just want to publicly thank Nick for what he has done. I had to and appreciate mm -hmm. him moving forward. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And I have two hurricanes during that period. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Jeez. Let's not forget. Yes. And he never. He, he always carried his stress very well because very. Yeah intense moments yeah. and he just handled himself so well so thank you thank you nick it's a good job working the golf course i was just going to say we could put a nameplate on one of those golf carts <laughs> yeah and, and 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 council president also makes a, a good point it, you know there are numerous other people 
uh, who, who really um, step mm -hmm. up to the plate. And so, so I don't want to be remiss and not uh, uh, thank them and appreciate them uh, yes. as well at this time. Um, you know, and, and yeah. our, our entire staff, I mean, who, who responded and, and really made sure that our residents, the services our resident continued on. Mm -hmm. um, this 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 is about Nick, but Nick was always about everybody else. So, yeah. So it's a big, big a big thank you. Always is yes, thank you. Okay. okay. Anything else? I don't want to pull this to no. I just wanted uh, Mr. Gross to explain to the public <clears throat> two seventy nine twenty two uh, certification of the annual audit. Um, what that actually means. Yeah. And another commendation. Okay, that, that, <laughs> that was my other. That yeah, was that good. was my other one I wanted to talk mm -hmm. about tonight. This is certification of the annual audit, and this is something that we, every year uh, when when uh, we're required to have an independent uh, agency come in and audit um, our, our 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 books, audit our processes, our procedures, um, and um, as part of that process, the the the. The state has mandated that every governing body is required to certify uh, that they've that they've received the audit and that they reviewed certain sections of the audit, and that's what this resolution is about tonight. Um, what this resolution is not about tonight, and what you don't see in this resolution, is a resol or, a, or an additional resolution for a corrective action plan. Mm -hmm. The reason that there's no um, corrective action plan is that the auditors found no comments or recommendations. So after a thorough review of all of our staff's activities, they, they, they found nothing uh, that they wanted to comment on in terms of correction. Um, Bravo. Uh, I, was Bravo. Say, I, think, I think that should be really, for uh -huh. not, not for anything else. Um, we sit around this table, we take a tremendous amount of criticism. We're individually called out for criticism. Um, we always talk about and identify the fact that, you know, we can do better, we can do this, we can do that, this with our employees, that with our... Uh, I think this audit speaks volumes about operations mm -hmm. in West Orange, the level of commitment that the people who you don't see on a regular basis that walk these halls, come in here and keep this town running. Um, I think this just speaks volumes to their, to, to their business acumen professionalism, dedication, and commitment to the township of West Orange. Yeah. So quite frankly, I think we need to give all of those people involved a round of applause and a hearty thank you. I, 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 I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and, and this is a feat when you, in of itself, take into consideration that this is not the first, but it's the, and it's not the second, but it is the third year in a row that our auditors have come in here and left without finding a reportable comment. And that is, mm -hmm. I, I've, <laughs> in, my, in my experience, mm -hmm. I've never seen any that, that happen before. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, and it is a testament to, you know, the administration can, can put together the rules and regulations and 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 do our job and to make sure that every we have a good shot at, at doing everything right. But our staff walks the walk and talks the talk mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. day. Yes. And, and so this done. is a big mm -hmm. salute to, to yeah. them. For Sounds like we need a party. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna pay for that. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Gross, uh, and your, and to your entire team. I think. I completely agree. I think this is something to be uh, celebrated. Um, uh, so I'm good with 279. Good. I, I'd like to pull. But thank you for bringing that up. Because You're welcome, Council President. Um, 283 and 285, I'd like to pull if they have not yet been pulled. I know 284 mm -hmm. has been. Okay. 285 was pulled. 285 was, yep. Yeah. Okay, so 283 also, okay. please. <clears throat> Okay. Are we ready to Madam Clerk, okay. I think so. Yes. So is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The consent agenda is implemented. Um, let's see. 283-22, resolution revoking resolution of local support for chemistry no. LLC. Councilman Rutherford, you pulled this. Yes, I'm uh, curious as to why 
we're revoking uh, the resolution of local support for chemistry. I'll just start there. So, Mr. Mayor. So as, again, the, these three, the, that resolution is sort of in concert with 284.22, which is the resolution of local support for uh, the Library of New Jersey uh, uh, Incorporated. Essentially, what had happened was um, chemistry had, had, had submitted an application um, with a letter of intent from the, um, from the, land, from the I believe the, the landlord of the property, or the, I'm sorry, the realtor of the property, um, as their evidence of site control, which is something that we had sort of said would be okay because, again, we were trying to keep the barrier of entry low, not requiring a specific fee or a specific lease. Um, so we had gone through the application, made a recommendation, uh, the council had passed the resolution authorizing uh, uh, local support. Um, it was when we re reviewed the application from the Library of New Jersey where they had essentially the same address. So we said, okay, there's one property for the second application. So we had to figure out what to do. Um, so uh, we had issued a letter to Chemistry to confirm that they were not proceeding with that location. Um, they confirmed that they were not proceeding with that location. So based upon that, we were revoking the resolution of support because they're going to ultimately going to have to come back with a new application with a new property um, because obviously they don't have site control of that property anymore. So, so the the company and I didn't I don't believe I actually voted for them but I I could be wrong but the company is not allowed to submit a separate address. I mean, if we've evaluated their application and a and giving them a letter of support based on what they've submitted to us and the address changes, they're not allowed to change the address? Well, they need site control. Well, they're not just site control. Part of this is, it's really just, I mean, counseling process has a lot to do with the location of the proposed business. The idea is, I mean, to be honest with you, it's not just about whether we think they're going to be good, you know, members of the community and things like that, but a lot of it has to do with the idea of, like for example, I you know this this issue about do we want many cannabis retail locations in the same place? Part of it is sort of deciding. Like, I mean, those are two different things. Well, no, no, I understand, but but part, but 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 location is like a big chunk of the consideration. So if someone comes in and says we're planning on putting a business here, all of a sudden that changes. It affects whether or not you know the township should support that proposed business because the location changes. Like that seems, so, I mean, just as if there's a material change in anything else in the application. It's, so it's not just about. No, I understand that. But when you allow for a letter of intent, you have to understand that that is non-binding and that could actually happen where sure. they no longer sure. are going to locate there. And so they abided by the rule. Well, not necessarily. Well, there's. there's yeah, there's. So no. Yeah. So, okay, talk to me. No, no, no. Look. <laughs> There's a debate about whether or not there should have been more stringent requirements, whether you needed a signed lease or you needed a, a, a deed all saying that you're going to buy the property. But ultimately, you know, when the process was, um, I, I believe it was maybe not in the, in the, in the um, ordinance, but it was in the ultimately what was the requirement of the application was that because of the fact we wanted to, we didn't want to make the barrier of entry high. And that was a sort of a policy decision that was made. And this is a result of that. But at the same time, it allowed for it maybe allowed for applicants who may not have um, had the opportunity in other municipalities that had more stringent um, requirements to apply, and so we that that was the sort of the balancing test. That's what it was, and and the reality is, this is kind of what the you know this is what happened, and they lost the property to another applicant, and so once we found that out. We moved ahead. We found out that they were no longer proceeding there, and that's why this is on. This is why. So, were, were they given an opportunity to submit a a new uh, location, a new address? Uh, who chemistry. chemistry? Oh yeah, they they um, in fact they within the last week or so they've resubmitted a new application with a new address. Okay, so why if if they ha and is the new address in an acceptable location? I don't know. We haven't, had to, we, haven't, we haven't had a meeting or, or any sort of review on it at all. 
So that's interesting. So you've had it for a week, and you're going to revoke their letter of support without reviewing if the new address is in a suitable location? Yeah, because they're not, because the, the, the this for this address. Right, this, this, is for this address. address. The 24 Park Place, they're not going to be able to open there. So we can't support their proposed business to be at 24 Park Place because we know that they don't have site control and there's another business coming to utilize that property. All right, and so in the way you found that out, was because you reviewed New Jersey Library's application. Yes. So, no? Well, that's not Didn't me. you got a letter? No, we, they yeah. came to the meeting. They came to the meeting, and that's when we were aware of the oh, new Oh, okay. Well, okay. I was not, yeah. it was not at that meeting. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yo, I don't, that's, formally was, it was, it was when, I, for me, it was when I was reviewing the application, and I noticed the same thing. Okay, so when, how did we find out? Castellino just said they came here in a meeting and announced that they had a lease with that. Yeah. Shortly thereafter, we got a notice from the client themselves. Yeah, and then, uh, no, actually, no. It was before that. When, when we were made aware here, I reached out to chemistry to ask them, did they know that there was a lease that was signed? And they were aware, and they were looking for an, another location. The reason why we have to revoke this is because they're going to need a new one if they're going to apply again to the state. They've recently submitted a new application. We've yet to review it, and we'll consider the location. And um, so, so they have to apply again to the state? They will have to submit a new resolution to the state with the oh. change of address. And to so their current application at the state is null, null and void. They'll have to. I can't speak to that. I don't it, know it, was, that's, I, it was just said. Oh, it, no. it did. It was. It, it's held in abeyance okay, no. to give them an opportunity to cure. So the state will give them an opportunity to cure, but we won't. We are. What the and resolution? The resolution to revoke this property support is because. We, they no longer have the site control. So they can't have two resolutions of support for two different addresses. When we review it, it'll come back before the council and we'll make a decision and a determination then. But we can't give chemistry two resolutions of support for two different addresses, just like we should not have two businesses located at the same address with the same resolution of support. All right, I, I, I understand that. I am. Um, I had another I'm issue sorry. with the letter too. of intent. Itself, if you want to hear. No, I'd love to hear, yes. So my issue with the letter of ten itself is that it was not signed by the owner of the LLC and there was no power of attorney uh, with it. It also wasn't present the night we interviewed them and that's a correction that we made with the task force to uh, moving forward. All that paperwork has to be in place uh, when we interview again. No, nobody's fault. This is just the way it got rolled out. We're trying to accommodate. Uh, applicants and uh, you know again stay through this at us and and we are you know progressing and 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 moving forward as we have to but I had an issue with the letter of intent that was received I also had I didn't appreciate finding out about it at a council meeting from a new applicant so that was disappointing for me and I'll, I'll leave it at that I will say though just so the public is also clear those letters of intent are acceptable at the state level so signed by the LLC it doesn't matter no. who a letter of intent yes, is does. signed by because with a letter of intent a real estate professional can sign off on a letter of intent for commercial for and commercial if they space. have a POA there was no POA you know, you you know you do loans all the time. This is my my livelihood. So the reason why this is on the agenda is because they have to seek a new resolution with yes. the new address. So I'm I'm concerned about that because we have these three together. Um, one two eighty three is to revoke a resolution of local support. Two eighty four is to issue a new local uh, letter resolution of local support, and two eighty five is to suspend accepting applications for letters of local support. And, and part of that, I, you know, I, I, I would expect that we would give some opportunity to an applicant that has already gone through the process and received whether the process was flawed or not. 
a letter of local support, some opportunity to cure before we would issue a, before we would suspend receiving new uh, applications for letters of local support. But in addition to that, and this is something I communicated with Councilwoman Matute Brown earlier today, um, it appears to me, based on the timing of these applications, that we have not, in fact, uh, gone through them in order. I re address this to you as well, Mr. Moon. Right, let me address, I'll address all of it. So one, consistent with the discussion from the last council meeting, the suspension was going to begin January 1st, 2023. All of the applications that have been filed between now and before now to then will be considered yeah. and still will be considered and will be deemed pending, which is why, for example, chemistry's application, while we're rescinding the resolution, their application will be so it's irrelevant now ultimately because they did submit a new um, amended application, but the ones, the applications that have been submitted won't be cut off. They're, not, they're going to be considered. So that's, that's, uh, that was basically what the council had asked me for, if I wasn't mistaken. No, it wasn't. It was, yeah. That's what we asked for. Yeah. Well, my, my question today was, it appears that um, one applicant applied several months before two others that had already gotten letters so of local support. I'll, I'll address this head on. And uh, Council Matute Brown had basically made the comment already, so I'll just reiterate it. They were considered. Their application was cir circulated to members of the advisory task force. They reviewed it. There was discussions about it. And as I said, that was, maybe I was, not, I was being a little too subtle last time, but there were concerns about the location of that specific application. Part of it was that it was in close proximity to another cannabis retail location, specifically retail, because the idea was having multiple in the same area, would dilute their ability to their business. And also there was a concern that we didn't we want to avoid having sort of these whatever green zones or where multiple retails are concentrated in one area. All of those things were considerations. Rather than say no to this application altogether, um, it was there was discussions, I don't know, uh, again it was between um, Chief uh, Chief Abbott uh, with I believe it was Ms. Gibbs basically explaining those concerns. So rather than say no, recommending just flat out denial, we said we'll keep it open to allow you to potentially find another location that may be better suited, that would be more favorable by the task force. So the location, I think, at least as far as I can recall from public comment, the, the um, displeasure with the location was in uh, was be, was in regards to their proximity to another retail, which is what you just said. So part of it was that. Now I can, I can I can tell you I can tell you right now, the con consistently and again it's been reflected in every single report that I've issued from the task force is this idea of they don't want retail, particularly because that's where the con customers and consumers are actually coming in and out. Are from from the very first evaluation report, if you recall there was about like six or seven that were all within the one intersection. So we set the tone right there and we said, we don't want multiple in a specific concentrated area. So from the very beginning, that was a principle that was reflected by the beliefs and the views of the task force. And even more recently, in the last um, report that I issued, uh, I believe it was your TANF, which was the, um, uh, which was the, the, the cultivator. cultivator. There was discussion about the fact that as a cultivator, it was in close proximity with a couple of other license holders, but because it was a cultivator, it wasn't a concern. So this concern has been in every single writing that's been issued. So it's been no secret. This isn't, this isn't something that like we're hiding a secret set of criteria, but that's the most obvious issue with it. There are other concerns as well, but the fact of the matter is the task force members selected and approved by this council were ultimately they're, they basically view fav more favorably the application for um, the Library of New Jersey rather than the location for um, this other pending application. So at the end of the day, you guys have now have the authority to either affirm what the recommendation was by the task force or to go your own way. Right, but on that point, the issue was in proximity proximity to the place that was controlled by initially chemistry, ultimately NJ Library. And then it was discovered that chemistry did not have site control. Yes. And another applicant 
had already had their application in, had not received an interview, and instead of being considered for that area, even it was, though it wasn't that site. They were. They were considered. They, so w when were they interviewed? They weren't interviewed, but they were considered. Yeah, you don't have oh. to be interviewed. Okay. Right. So there's some criteria by which you will uh, interview someone who's already gotten a uh, license from the state and someone if, or not. Well, first of all, the, 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 the process has always been, if the location is not going to work, yeah. What's the point of bringing them in? Yeah, why why, why waste their time? Why give them yeah. the quote hope that you guys keep talking about? So what was communicated to them, at least what I understand from the last council meeting with Chief Abbott responded as well as they did at the podium, was not that the location wouldn't work, that it was too close to another location. And then... I'm sorry, I don't understand the difference. Okay. Because you said there are other things in addition to proximity to another retail establishment. If there are other things in addition to the retail establishment, that should have been communicated to them. If it's the proximity to another, let me finish. If it's the proximity to another retail establishment, when that retail establishment's proximity was no longer a factor from a prior applicant, then based on the timing of receiving these applications, they should have received a review. And it doesn't appear that they were, or an interview. I, it I doesn't think, appear that they were. I, I think that you're conflating the two. At the end of the day, they were not brought in for an interview even with the task force because everyone on the task force did not like the location. That's the bottom line. They didn't like the location. Secondary to that was the proximity to. Now, so that's Mr. not what you said before. But I, I said. The, Absolutely the, is what. Clear, it, it, right? my, my issue has always been location. It's right, the location where they have is the old Vienna school. It's just far too congested. And I understand that the applicant has made um, a traffic study, but we all travel Main, Main yeah. Street. It's congested. And there's residential units. And, and so that was the reason why we did not, we, the task force decided we're not going to reject them. We're going to give them time to find another location. Mm -hmm. That's where they are now. It's not about preference. It's about us giving them the courtesy of saying, we're not going to reject your application. We're going to give you some time to find a new location. Now, I know that there has been conversations with the chief with respect to what other locations, because we have limited locations. I'm not involved with that. The task force is not involved with that. It, I think that it is courtesy on, on the part of the task force to give them the opportunity to find another location as opposed to just outright rejecting them. So I think whatever the issues are, whether it's location or some other issue, they should be clearly communicated. If, we're going, if we're going to provide an opportunity to cure. The problem is also that it's, a, it's, a, it's an advisory task force with different members for different reasons. One member might not like it for one reason. Another might uh, not like it for the location for another reason. But the consensus is they don't like the location. I can't sit here and basically tell Councilwoman Michelle Castellino to pick up the phone and call every single applicant to tell them what they don't do or don't yeah. think about their application. No, I, and I wouldn't encourage you to do that. Let me, and let we're me, not supposed to give legal advice right. to the I'm not. I'm not encouraging you that either. I do think there has to be communication between the task force and the applicants with regard to what the issues are. Now, whatever the mechanism of that communication is, that's fine. But, but it should be the same for everybody. But Councilman, but I don't understand. I, I'm yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. What can I communicate with them? We said... The, 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 council, the, the, the task force did not view favorably the location. And then they can come back and try to debate us on it. But again, where does that get us? So and so I will say, I'm sorry, I, I just want to interrupt because I do have an email from, from the police chief who, who clearly has communicated because she, the, at one, the applicant, Ms. Gibbs, um, wanted to discuss two other possible cure locations with the task force. We're not doing that. So they were clearly communicated upon with by the chief and because there is no formal evaluation report it gives them that opportunity to go cure it now what the count what the task force will not do is hear applicants say hey what do you think about this location that's not our responsibility it actually is damaging if we do that to them i don't want to give anyone false hope that because the town the task force may like the location that the council will as well so yes they were they were notified i'm i'm reading this from my email wanted to bounce to other cure locations we're not doing that we we are giving them the opportunity to decide what location they're going to Definitely. choose if we had proceeded and we had to make a recommendation to 
formally deny their application, right? Based on what's going on, even with the, the resolution suspending, what we would be saying is no. So you now have to find a new place between now and January 1st. We didn't do that. We're waiting and holding and hoping that leaving them as a pending application, they can go out now and find another location that may be more suitable for the task force. Now, I definitely, definitely would not recommend sitting there basically doing tours with potential applicants looking for locations with them. I don't think that's appropriate. But the idea of like getting, getting a pre-approval on potential locations is something that task force really can't do. Yeah. So what, what I'm getting yeah, at... The chief should not be playing realtor. Right. And I, I've not suggested he should. I've not suggested the task force should go on a tour with any applicant. What I am saying is that whatever is communicated from the task force to the applicants should be consistent across all applicants, and it should be a formal process. But, but Councilman... And I've sat here, let me, let me finish, Mr. Moon. I've sat here and heard complaints all summer long and now all fall, and they all stem around communication. And if it is, if it is as simple as you make it seem tonight, then that, that would have been a simple communication that could have probably avoided months of back and forth. But, Councilman, by simply telling a potential applicant that the task force does not view favorably on the location, Mm -hmm. Isn't that message obvious? I don't understand what could have been done more to communicate that. Well, if so, in this case, and, and we're we're beating a dead horse now because it appears as if you you guys have already made your decision. But if you communicate that the task force doesn't look favorably upon this location, it's too close to another one, and then the other one disappears, or the person that had it before them. The entity that had it before them no longer has it. Like that, that would seem to me that they would then be able, the proximity issue is gone. But, but, you know, but, but, but again, what we said was they were considered. When, when we had a meeting specifically, when we realized, when we got the confirmation that chemistry was not proceeding with that location, the task force had a meeting and we had to discuss what we were going to do. We had two pending applications at the time. We had, we had, uh, we had the, 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 the one that's on tonight. Right, the one that's on for tonight. And, and the other one. And then the other one. And so there was a question of what do we want to do? And the task force made a recommendation, and that we are where we are. Mm. That's basically what happened. So, so, so the representation that they weren't considered is just not accurate, and quite frankly, it's not fair. Because we did consider Well, them. I mean, you may not think it's fair. No, 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 no. You may, you may, you may think it's, we you may think what yeah. we did was wrong. We need to wrong, wrap this up. But mm. I think that, again, had we just said no to them? So I think there's space in between ignoring them and but they were not yeah. ignoring and telling not them ignoring that the space is in too close the proximity over and over again in different ways. to another place. So there is some space between ignoring them there and telling them that the location is not good because of proximity. But this gets back. I mean, it's a it, it's a circular argument, right? Because no, it, it, isn't. And, it isn't. Let, can I finish, please, Council President? Yeah, sorry. So if if we're giving uh, if we're leaving them open as a pending application and giving them an opportunity to cure the address. Um, and, and the address is the issue that has to be cured. I, there's, there's clearly more communication needed because it's a similar issue to what chemistry is facing where they need to cure their address. And I guess we're allowing some mechanism for it, assuming they get their application in in time. I understand that they may have put one in already. I, I hope that is Chemistry the case. Chemistry doesn't have site control up there. It doesn't have anything to do with it. They have a second. They submitted an amended application with a new location. We have a new location. We have a not for this. Not for this right. one. Right. Right. So it, it just seems to me that communication in this process um, leaves something to be desired. You may not like that criticism. That's okay. We're not here to, this is not about being friends. All right. This is about business. Right. And if folks consistently came through, some of whom have subsequently been awarded letters of local support, have come through and complained about the communication. We need to take that complaint to heart and make some changes. If, if there's something deficient in either the, the mechanism in which we communicate or the content of the communication, then we need to, to address that, on, acknowledge it, and then address it. Uh, and I, I don't even feel like, I think like,
the way it's sounding to me tonight from Councilwoman Matu Brown and from you, Mr. Moon, uh, is that, no, we've done everything right. It, we, we all sat through the same council meetings all year long, and people have made the same complaints all year long. So something hasn't been done right. Whatever that something is needs to be addressed. Council President, um, can I make a motion to um, move to approve Resolution 283? Well, I, I still have some questions. So I know you'd like to move on. But I'm, Councilman, I'm Councilman, not done. I, please. I, th there is no, nothing more. I'm, I'm there not is done. nothing more to. You can have your questions, but there is nothing more to say I know, about because this I'm entitled to resolution. That as a council person. Absolutely, but there's nothing more so to this stop resolution than me. no. I asked Council President. Okay, I made we'll a motion. There is a motion on the floor to move on this agenda. Can I have a second? I still have questions. He still has but questions, yeah. It, yeah. If you have a question, so, so I, I still have questions. that's it, it, different it, it, from the one you just asked. Because yeah. I it, think it, there we got, been we a lot of statements. On there hasn't been a question poised. No. The question that was poised was answered by Mr. Moon. So if we're going to do a point of order and we're going to move forward, then let's be particular yeah, about what you're stating. And have a particular question as opposed to... I, I have been asking questions and engaging in what I would consider robust debate which I think this matter deserves. But, but, again, but again, Councilman, ask, you know, ask the, a particular straightforward question. So the question we answered so far is, you know, what happened? We explained what had happened. So now what is your follow-up question for that? You've got to just make it a straight question. So... But I love to answer you, but I, right. I need to know that. And I, I didn't think this was not set up for. as a debate. It was set up. Let's. It became a debate well, because I'm getting to, I know, interrupted. I don't know that you're listening to the answers that you're getting. Well, I am. Just rephrasing the question. Or uh, can we? Can no, I'm not. Ask, can we give okay. Councilman an I, opportunity I, to continue? Uh, thank you. Ask your questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so my recommendation was that we acknowledge the fact that there is some challenge with the way we've communicated and the content of that communication. And then the question becomes, what is the mechanism by which we're going to cure that on our side? What is the protocol we're going to use or the process we're going to use to communicate these things fairly across all applicants? Because clearly, based on the council meetings we've had all summer long and now all fall, and hearing consistent complaints about communication, Something is wrong. Now, you may want to choose to address that in your next meeting, but that's something that needs to happen. So I, I will say that um, this is probably the last task force meeting since this um, administration will change and the task force will change. So you're happy to, I mean, you're welcome to make those recommendations. But at this point, we're not changing the process that we've had because the process has worked well. You do have a bizarre, I'm sorry. I Go ahead, finish. But this feels like a bizarre prosecution of me specifically. And I'm fine with that. Uh, however you like to phrase it, that I'm uncomfortable or embarrassed, there's no uncomfortability for me, mm -hmm. except for the task force members who feel offended by being accused of not doing the work properly. They're volunteers. They're your constituents. And this feels like a political grandstanding. Okay. We have a, we have processed so many applications, given so much time, and by you stating that we are not communicating, I'm reading an email where the applicants are looking for new places and they want our suggestion as to whether or not they're acceptable. Now, I'm not engaging in those conversations. It's yeah. inappropriate. It's all staring. Yeah, all it's right, inappropriate. So, oh, well, so I, I well, I am still, I am still speaking. I am still speaking. What I am saying is that we've heard you, and and there is nothing Mr. wrong with Mr. the communication. Moon, that I was, was a still communication speaking. I was still speaking. At the administration. I, but I'm sorry, the Mr. President. Can, yeah. All right, there's a point of order now on the floor. Right. No, it's not. That, can, can we have no, a this, point, this point of order? This is the grandstanding. No. This is the, this this is the is politics okay. All right. entering the process. All right. We're going to Thank stop. you, Council President. Thank you. So, 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 so I'm going to so make a motion. The question is, right, the, so, there so, was so, a question so, about communication. So, so Councilman, you know, your, your, your question raises a criticism of the communication from the task force to applicants. That's fine. I, you know, I'll, 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 I'll advise the, the task force accordingly. But again, having been part of the process, I can tell you that, to be honest with you, 
in the, in the instance that you're talking about, more was done for them than as far as even communication goes. Because to be honest with you, my recommendation would always have been just yes or no, mm -hmm. no back and forth, right? Easiest way to do it. But mm -hmm. again, because there were some strong feelings about the quality of some of the applicants, we wanted to try to work with them when, when possible and within reason. But if that's creating more of an issue, then my recommendation moving forward is just gonna be look at the application, yep. Doesn't me measure the merits, measure the location, take a vote, do we wanna bring them in or not? Yes or no, and then leave it at that, and we can make the recommendation to the council and leave it at that. Well, whatever the recommendation and, and, is. And, I'll, and quite frankly, I'll tell them to stop communicating altogether, because that may be the real <laughs> no, be be worse. Yeah, No, because we're reading emails right here. Right. We're reading emails no, exactly. that people are communicating so I, I think with each that's other. A, I think that's an, uh, an overreaction. The point is, Mr. Moon, to communicate effectively and consistently. And that's the recommendation, right? Because we, we have heard that same complaint from multiple people, okay. But right? But okay. The problem is also, you, if you talk about consistency, the very first round were responses to the request for applications. There were 10 applicants, right? We, walked, we came away recommending four. Now, would it have been appropriate for, 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 for me to tell the task force we should reach out to the other six to see about working yeah, with them to exactly. find new locations. So if you want to talk about consistency, the consistent thing would have been to easier to say yes based on the application and no and move on. And that's exactly what I'm saying. Whatever you do for one should be done for them all because when there is no consistency, it leaves moments like this. Right, so my, so my recommendation be would be to move forward, not have... The well, you, you will be the attorney likely advising the task force next year. Who, so, and, and if that is the case, then I would expect you would take these notes and bring it to the task but force. I just, I, just, I just want to make it clear, though, that if that was the case, then well, the application... I'm not concerned would, about the outcome. No, 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 I understand that. I mean, I, look... I'm concerned about the process. Okay, okay. Right. Can I, 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 need to, I need to say something, right. Councilman, because if you don't mind me jumping in at this point, because I was a task force member... And in defense of the other task force member, thousands and thousands of pages of paperwork we get. So if the council isn't happy with the way the process is, come January, as, uh, as Councilwoman stated, you know, we could go back and, you know, we, we, you know the council could do the work if, if, mm -hmm. you, if you don't like the, the process. I mean, that is a possibility. Not saying that that's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. Second fact is, I, I think moving forward, and again, this was, you know, just a new process. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have the instruction sheet to say here, this is how this task force is going to operate. Uh, we started it from, from scratch. Um, you know, maybe an assigned monthly a night of, uh, each month so everybody knows when, when that meeting would be. And just like the planning board, you either will have the meeting or, or if there aren't any applicants mm -hmm. that month, then you don't have the meeting. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, what this council has to decide, and this goes into the next resolution, so I'll just speak to it now very quickly, with postponing, you know, putting the pause, which I, I entirely agree upon, but and not till January 1st, is because I, I truthfully feel that, you know, we have these two now in play, chemistry and, and um, uh, Mr. Gibbs and his wife's. I, I mean, we're really going to entertain other folks putting in an application between now and January 1st, and then we have limited, limited space for in, in the township of where these places will go. I'm already hearing, you know, people, I, I'm not sure if one is going to go in Pleasantdale Center. I have people calling me up, you know, uh, you know, that's where the kids travel. So, I mean, there's limited spots in town, but again, like the council has to decide how many, how many do you want to have? We said we were going to have four, then we went to micro business and that could be unlimited and, and so on and so forth. So when the task force does their jobs and trying to be mindful of where to put the retail, um, and then, you know, we turn folks away, the, the, you know, my council colleagues, you can't then say we're not following the process or the communication. Location denied. So if you don't want the task force denying locations and not moving applicants forward, so then take, 
take it back to the council and every you decide well, here. That's and not do my all issue. The homework and read the thousands of pages and do the work that the task force has been doing. So, so I think my position is being mischaracterized. I'm not criticizing the task force. I'm criticizing the communication coming from it. Now, I, I don't, I, excuse me, please, come on. I am grateful that we had a task force to go through those thousands of pages of documents. And I think that is the responsibility when you sign up for that, to go through that, to go through that process. And, and I, all I'm saying is, when we make those decisions, they have to be consistent and they should be communicated consistently. Now, to your point about 285, this is, for me, about communication. Yeah. Like, regardless of how many we want to have, we can't just stop the process without communicating to people that the process is going to stop. And, and otherwise, I feel like we are disadvantaging folks that are trying to get in the process. So the, the, this gets back to communication for me, too. Like January 1st, some may think it's too soon, some may think it's too long, or some may think we don't need to have it at all. But we absolutely do need to communicate that the process will close before we close the process so that people that are in the process of, app, of applying you know, have some, some, kind of no, some kind of date to work against. So, Councilman, really that's, where I, that's where I agree with you there. But I did have my hand raised before to ask that question about if we do suspend this come the end of the year, January 1st, are you still, are you going to meet as a task force between now and the end of the year for those applications that are now pending? We, we, because we would have to, because, would have, because yes, we have pending have applications. So there's, yes. with, with um, chemistry being one, and we still have, and if natural vibes. natural vibes finds another location, then yes. Okay. okay. So I as a, a, I'd like to, to call the that. vote. I so second. There was a motion. Okay, okay, there we go. I need a, a second. Second. Um, no, oh, you gave me the okay. first. Yeah. Uh, Councilwoman Williams. Second. And this is just for 283. 283, yes. So... Councilwoman Matute Brown made yes. a motion. I need oh. a second. I second. Oh, you did? Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, Councilwoman Casalino? Uh, yes. Councilwoman Matute Brown? Yes. Councilman Rutherford? No. Councilwoman Williams? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Okay. okay. 284 yep. 22, resolution of local support of proposed cannabis related business, the Library of New Jersey, Inc. Councilwoman Matute Brown, you pulled this. Thank you. I pulled this because we have representation from the New Jersey Library. So if you can come up, gentlemen, please. Introduce yourselves. Give us a little bit of background about who you are and um, what your business is. Uh, well, my name is Corey Dishman. I reside on Llewellyn Avenue on West Orange. I am the CEO of the company. Um, this is my partner, Charles Penn. He's not a resident of West Orange, but <clears throat> very involved in the community. Um, we started this company a year ago, but we began preparation for this process three years ago. Um, at that time, none of the regulations were put in place. We didn't know how things were gonna pan out, but he came to me with an idea. And I believed in it without hesitation and agreed that I would partner up with him to make this thing happen. And that's what we've been working tirelessly on. Um, not only the money, <clears throat> but the sacrifice, um, the obstacles that we've had to endure as not only um, a micro business, but obviously men of color in this industry where it's less than 4% owned by people of color. Um, financial hardships, things of that nature that we've encountered and we've managed to overcome. Um, my father's actually here tonight too. He is the COO of our company, so he brings his expertise from um, the corporate world as well. But, you know, we set forth to have a upscale, sophisticated environment for mostly middle-aged and elderly people to be able to come and get educated on something that they may have limited information on. They may have tried it back in the 70s and haven't, haven't tried it since, and they just need some guidance and some education with regard to all the options that are out there now. Um, so 
our commitment was not only to having a successful company, but to educating the public, to empowering the public, and to being part of our community. Um, not only within the West Orange community, but the greater community, New Jersey and America. So, you know, certain things that we do, um, we hope that they'll benefit um, the masses. You know, a lot of what we do is not for us. It's for people that are in like sim or similar circumstances where they're trying to uh, start a cannabis company or something in the realm thereof. And they're faced with these obstacles that we were, overcome, we were able to overcome. So we just consider ourselves to be a beacon of inspiration and hope for those that are in, or are coming from similar circumstances. So um, that's pretty much the bulk of what I have to say. I'll let my partner continue. Thank you, Mr. Dishman. Sorry. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Or good night. Yeah. Um, uh, Sorry, yes. Or good morning. Maybe good morning. Um, one thing that I said uh, months ago in our first major interview, and I still hold that true, um, is that we want to be of the community and not just in the community. This is something that's extremely important to us. Uh, one of our models is mature and mainstream. I feel like this is something we're trying to do for the cannabis industry. We want to show that we can be valuable to communities. I grew up in Maplewood in South Orange, uh, which is very close to here. Uh, I understand the nature of communities like this. I never wanted to disrupt it. I never wanted to take away from it. I only wanted to add to it. Uh, this is very important to me, not just for this community, but in general, because I feel like my business partner and I are the ones who can transition this cannabis culture to something that is respected the same way that alcohol is. Um, we really, really didn't know the stance or the position that we would be put in when we began this journey. Uh, people come up to us all the time and tell us how much of an inspiration we are, how much of a beacon of hope that we are for people who look like us, who come into this industry and are able to navigate it and be successful. That's, uh, that weight is something that I I am uh, super grateful for and honored to have, um, and it's my constant motivation. I did this not just because it's a billion dollar industry. I'm not gonna say that that was not a factor in why we, we started to do this, but I have children. Um, I wanna build a legacy beyond just where I'm at now, and I wanna make sure that my highest heights are the floor in which they can start their journey on, and this is a part of that. Um, once again, I'm not physically of this community, but I feel like I'm a part of it now, and I only want to bring benefit to it, truthfully. That's all we ever sought out to do, and I know we're going to accomplish it because we've accomplished everything up until this point. Um, yeah, that's, that's about it. We're really just here for the community, and, and I'm, I'm happy to, you know, be in this moment. Thank that's you, all. Mr. Pim. So with, it, with each applicant that came forward, did you want to say a few words, sir? Thank you. Yes, please. My name is Andre Dishman, mm -hmm. and I'm Corey's father, as he alluded to earlier. Uh, they've done a, a heck of a job in, in planning this out and getting to this point. I've had uh, over 15 years of corporate experience, um, a lot of times bringing uh, corporation distributors into fruition, showing them how to, to uh, set their business up and setting up the, the flow of the business, everything from buying goods to the goods going out of the door. I hope to, to uh, be able to do that for this business as well and to, uh, to give them the, the opportunity to, to tax my brain and anything that they <laughs> want as far as the experiences that I've had. So thank you. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. So I was going to say, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I am in support of this resolution. But each applicant that did come before us, I asked for three things. One was informative literature, and I know that you did put something together already. The other was to have community presentations, even if you did it right here, so that we can educate our population. And I want to see vision-impaired goggles for our driver education class. I need, we need to educate our students about, you know, about any implications and about... We've already um, began reaching out to SAC, and I've spoken to Mr. Moore already. Okay, thank um, you. So we will be doing things in that, um, in that area, especially with regard to the high school. 
Okay. The parents and the students. Make sure you check with the Municipal Alliance um, Commission as well because um, they are, as I had mentioned earlier, um, doing something for impairment and opioid. Um, But that would be something very nicely for you all to tie into as well. I agree. Mm -hmm. Could I could I ask that you? I'm sorry, you were going to say something. Oh yeah, I was also going to say the company um, that is actually funding us and helping to be our mentors. They also have a person who does this across the country. Perfect. So we're going to be uh, partnering up partnering up with her soon to to work on all of this. Just okay. So, you know. So for the benefit of the public and my council colleagues, um, just I don't know if you had the opportunity to, and I hope that you read the evaluation report. One of the concerns that I initially had with New Jersey libraries, and I'm going to ask you to speak to it, um, was the fact that um, they had, I'm going to say, is it A-R-M? A-Y-R. A-Y-R. A-Y-R, which is an um, MSO, a large company, which is something the task force decided that we were not going to support because we want the people that were already invested in town given the opportunity for um, those marginalized communities who had been excluded. If there's only 4% in the state, it, it, it speaks volumes for the work that we still have to do. Um, but I reached out and we had a discussion. I'd like you to share the process by which they are part of your, well, your funders, but also how much um, interest, how much control are they going to have over business operations? Because, you know, we want people here, not companies. Of course, of course. I'll start this off. Um, Contractually, and according to uh, the legal documents that have been submitted to the state, AIR has zero interest in our company at all. Uh, We are the ones who are going to be running day to day. Uh, Once again, like I just previously stated, they are more mentors than anything else. And the reason this exists is um, New Jersey set it up so that the MSOs to be able to participate in the retail market that exists in New Jersey, they had to pair up with social equity applicants like ourselves. Now, we had to pair up with them because funding is insane. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with this process, but they, they, in order to maintain as much of our equity as possible, and we have 100% of our equity, uh, and that's something that most people can't say, but that's just how it played out as we navigated through this whole environment. Um, we didn't want to go the traditional route um, of, of finding multiple funders, uh, and we also wanted a situation in which we could have the best advisement as possible, and the the basic route for that is to pair up with the MSO. And uh, I know you guys may not know, because you are concentrated in West Orange, but most people in our position are partnered up with MSOs for this same mentor slash funding purpose. Uh, And it also helps the MSO. You may say, what benefit are they getting from it? It makes them look good to the CRC. They needed to do this in order to get their retail license with the CRC. They came into the state, they purchased the company. Uh, the company was uh, purely medicinal. In order, them f- in order for them to move to the other side of the market, they had to reach out. And truthfully, we reached out to them because we were the ones that were active in the community. We needed funding. They love to look great because we can put their name on things. We love to service the community. So it was a partnership that just came together and that's why we are where we are now. I'll let Corey elaborate on anything else. Now, Charles pretty much said uh, the bulk of things. So just to clarify and keep it simple, they own 0% of our company. They control 0% of our company. What they are doing is giving us a minimum of $600,000 towards our company for startup purposes. And that can go up to one point something million dollars, which has been submitted to the state, approved by the CRC, um, as our mentors, like he said, and our guarantors. So they'll be paying our expenses and our invoices as part of this social equity program. We just, we were able to secure something like this and structure this deal because we were very early with our preparation. Like I said, we started three years ago. So when we started reaching out to companies, nobody in New Jersey had began that process already. We were just ahead of the curve. And as a result of that, we managed to partner up with AIR. Um, We've done events with them as sponsors. And them just believing in us and seeing that they were able to use our community efforts 
for their application and to get approved. It's almost like a favor for a favor. You know, we help them get in this industry. Now they're turning around to help us get in it. And that's pretty much it. They don't get anything from our company. There's no assurances, no promises, and they don't own anything. So, Can you talk about the community efforts that you've already engaged in? Um, you don't have to talk about all of them. But. Okay. All right. Well, I know we started off here in West Orange. We had an expungement event that was free to the public at the Cambria Hotel. Um, from there, we had some extra funds, so we decided to feed the homeless for Thanksgiving. So we started with families in West Orange that we shopped for. We went to ShopRite. We actually personally shopped ourselves with our children for families within town and beyond. We dropped off those groceries, which was $200 per family. We served uh, 10 families, and then we bought turkeys for a church that fed 100 and fa 150 families in Belleville. Yeah, Belleville. In Belleville. So that was the start of it. And then from there, we had another expungement event in Rawway. Um, we actually attached an educational component to that where we, um, we paid people to attend career readiness training, which was provided by instructors from NJIT. For three weeks, they received $15 an hour and Stockton University. I'm sorry. They received fifteen dollars an hour for three weeks, and they um, they were basically given instructions on how to apply for jobs, how to fill out resumes, how to interview, what to wear for the interview, everything that was included with the. And yes, we did have high school students from West Orange High School involved with that process, and a few of them were subsequently hired for jobs. Um, very shortly thereafter, completing that program. Um, so that, that brought us onto a national scale where we became uh, very popular in the media for social equity and advocating for social equity. And they pretty much made us like the unofficial face for social equity, despite, you know, our brother James Jackson, who went very hard in that capacity. Um, but that, that led us to this point. And we have had um, a series of other community outreach programs and events that we've done. We are currently working on a huge event for May of 2023 that will be a national event that we're going to do in Atlantic City. Um, it'll be a benefits concert, a star-studded event, but we are raising $2.5 million to help 25 social equity companies across the nation that are in similar circumstances as us. They will receive a $100,000 grant from our company and we don't own anything. We're not asking for anything in return. We're just trying to help people out. So that just sums up pretty much. I just want to say I, I kind of grossed over it lately, but uh, my involvement with corporate was Fortune 100 companies. So, I mean, I really got involved with uh, how they had little businesses that, that would sell their products. They wouldn't sell to the individual. They had distributors and uh, uh, other shops that would do the resale. So you, you bring them on board, you have to set them up, show them exactly how the products are supposed to flow from the beginning to the end. And that's what I intend to do for uh, our business. And naturally, I, I can't do it all, but I'm gonna do as much as I can uh, to get up and running and learn a little bit about the weed business. And uh, I don't think I we'll have it. any problems in, in making West Orange proud of us. I really don't. Yes. That's what Thank we you. want. Thank you. Yes, incredible. I Obviously, we had the opportunity to interview you with the task force, and everyone was so very well impressed with all the work that you've done that has, has led you to be before us today. And hopefully, Thank you very much. hopefully we will have a positive um, outcome for the resolution of support and um, next steps. So I just had a question. Um, since they already have state approval, and now we're giving a letter of support. Can you walk us through what this now is going to look like since the process has typically been reversed and mm -hmm. then they come back mm -hmm. to us? Yes. Mm -hmm. So they will have to take this le the resolution of support, the zoning letter from our zoning officer, and provide that to the state. They have to convert their conditional application into an annual application now. So I don't know the timeline for the state that, that that's going to take with um, their conversion application, but once they're approved and they'll come back to the to the task force, 
Now we're going to look at specific information as to, um, and we won't get into the intellectual properties or anything like that in public, but we, we will want to know, um, you know, their standard operating procedures, what type of security, where cameras are, and th you know, more in depth. Um, how they're going to process their payments to the municipality. That'll be the second step. But I, I'm not sure, do you know how long the conversion application is going to take for the state? Well, the hope is that uh, we've already started our conversion application. Uh, it's basically a whole bunch of SOPs, uh, standard operating procedure for all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, the hope is that we can get it in uh, within the next week. Uh, hopefully, we'll be on the December uh, conversion, but there's no guarantee that the CRC is going to do that in December. So they, they're definitely addressing it in the new year, but there's the possibility that we can get it before the new year starts. So that's, that's just where we are right now. Zero guarantees. Please do not quote me. I know this is a public record, but I'm not <laughs> telling something that, that I know to be exact fact, but that's just the way it stands at the moment, essentially. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Call the vote. Okay. Is there a motion to approve 284-22? So moved. Second. Councilwoman Castellino? Yes. Councilwoman Matute Brown? Yes. Council, uh, Councilman Rutherford? Yes. Councilwoman Williams? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Welcome Congratulations, to gentlemen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good we look luck. forward to, to making you guys proud of us. We really That's do. Thank you. Appreciate thank that. You. I have a question. Um, well, let's act new business. Okay. And do I have to sign this because we didn't have an executive? The executive. Uh, Here, do you want this? Oh, you got yeah, it. I didn't sign this. Yes, I didn't sign that one. This was, oh wait, this had two. Yes, okay. And this was on consent. They really made me. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I Yeah, sorry. <laughs> We're just taking a, a small mm -hmm. break so that we could get paperwork in order. <laughs> Sorry. Do you wanted a copy of the resolution? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I gave you the wrong one. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I have one. No, I, I have five resolution temporarily suspending the acceptance of applications for local support of proposed cannabis businesses. Councilwoman Casalino. Yeah, so I started to talk about this resolution because of my concern with giving false hope to applicants, I guess is the best way to put it at this point. Um, I, I, I recommend we move that data. Mm. I, I just don't want more people applying. And, you know, I, I, my heart goes out to the, to the Gibbs. Um, you know, I mean, we could put a caveat in to hold it out for, for, for I guess we could do Whatever, Ms. So are you making wait. a friendly amendment to, to the resolution? Well, well that, that's what I, I like to make. Again, I guess I'll speed up because of the yeah, sake of time. With that, thank I, you. I'm probably going to get voted <laughs> down. But. Yeah, it's about Let's go. I know when uh, not to beat a dead horse. But, um, but no, I would like to make a motion to make an amendment to move the date up to even December 1st. And so by doing that, we you still need to hear with yeah, but this, the two that are pending. This won't impact that. That's what I no. mean. Okay. I just want to make sure. 
So is there a second on that motion? Well, well, as we're discussing it, so just so that we're clear what the impact of that is, and, and I understand why we're doing this. I sympathize with you. I don't want to give people yeah. false hope. Um, the impact is if people, if groups are not far enough along in the application process, they will have to abandon that application process here and look, and look elsewhere. Exactly. Which may be a good thing for them. Yes. Yes, that's my whole intent. From listening, like, you know, again, this happened. We, you know, we had folks in the beginning of the process. They didn't have all their paperwork in. We didn't hear some of them. Um, I hear you loud and clear. Everybody should be treated equally. And hopefully Mr. Moon has taken great notes and is correcting some of the things uh, that we came across, stumbled upon. But just to give people false hope, to, um, you know, again, they need everything in by, you're saying January 1st, I would say December 1st. So is there a second on the motion? Because we're continuing to have discussion. Is okay, there a second? Is, excuse me. So my another question. December 1st, moving the okay. date up to December 1st. And that is there a time limit on when do we resume this applica the well, application? That will come down the road. Okay, then second. You're going to second it. Okay. Councilwoman Castellino? Uh, for the amendment, yes. Councilwoman Matute Brown? I have to say no. Councilman Rutherford? Yes. Councilwoman Williams? No. Council President McCartney? Uh, yes. Thank Motion. you, Council Collins. For clarity, okay. there is no time certain for reopening the process, and, and I believe that is because we expect a newly constituted task yeah. force to some degree next year. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, basically, it, I didn't put, quite frankly, I didn't put a deadline because I didn't know what to put. But at the end of the day, this, this council can at any point, or the new council or whenever, can make a decision because they would want to reopen it up. So that was for the amendment. We still yes, need to vote on the ordinance. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Resolution, yeah. Oh, resolution, yeah. Oh, my apologies. Sure, no problem. Are we ready to vote on the resolution? Yes. Okay. Is there a motion to approve 285-22? As amended. As amended, yes. Second as amended. Okay. Councilwoman Castellino? Yes. Councilwoman Matute Brown? No. Councilman Rutherford? Yes. Councilwoman Williams? No. Council President McCartney? Yes. Okay. Okay. Ordinances on first reading 2698 22, bond ordinance funding and emergency appropriation providing for the local units allocable share of the unfunded portion of phase one of the flood mitigation facilities project of the joint meeting of Essex and Union counties. Buy in the township of West Orange appropriating $2,725,000, therefore, and authorizing the issuance of $2,725,000 bonds or notes to finance the cost thereof. Is there a motion to introduce on first reading? So no. moved. Second. Councilwoman Castellino? Yes. Councilwoman Matute Brown? Yes. Councilman Rutherford? Yes. Councilwoman Williams? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Okay. And any comments, questions? This is um, the reason that this is even coming about is because of a timing of payments issue and the ability to get a project started. Um, so there's, you know, there was literally nothing that could have been done to uh, avoid this. Thank you, Councilman. Okay, 26. Oh, go ahead. We have 26, to make a motion to adopt. We, we did. No, no, no. This no, is no. first. 2699-22, okay, an ordinance authorizing the execution of a license agreement with Pleasant Valley Productions, Inc. for use and operation of the Oscar Schindler Performing Arts Center. Is there a motion to introduce on first reading? So moved. Second. Councilwoman Castellino? Yes. Councilwoman Matute Brown? Yes. Councilman Rutherford? Yes. Councilwoman Williams? Yes. Council President McCartney. Yes. Just wanted to, um, for the members of the public, there is a red line version yeah. of what was amended and added to the initial licensing agreement um, that talks about, it's obviously their term will now be from September 1st, 2022, ending August 30th, 2025. Um, there's also going to be a um, termination um, time for both the 
Township and PVC. Um, that was also added. Um, and this is not in color, so I can't tell you what else was added at this time. But that's the, there were minor um, additions that were made to the um, contract, and I'm very happy that we are um, that that we are hopefully supporting um, them again this year because they've done such a wonderful job. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Mr. Gross. Months ago, when I feel like this is actually overdue, that I think this expired. Uh, months ago. Um, we did talk about this. I just want to make sure that everything was ironed out and questions that had been raised with Pleasant Valley Productions and they had questions about insurance and... We resolved all those and they're all... Er, er, the, the opening is included. I, and, Excellent. And with respect to the question of the insurance during our meeting that was discussed and, and um, um, the chair of PVP did understand that while she's the, they're the primary insurance carrier, they carry a, a, an amount that's far below ours. So the municipality would jump in and if that was something, yeah, an issue. To hear. Okay. okay. Next item is pending matters, new matters, council discussion. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, just the one thing since we're on the cannabis. I, I, yeah, oh. I, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I, I, I mentioned this briefly off the record, and I want this to be on the record, which is why I said I would hold this until we got to pending and new matters. But I think um, as an elected body, we need to really um, start contemplating um, on a personal note, uh, on a note for the municipality, how many cannabis retail mm -hmm. businesses we want in West Orange. And so right now, while we have allowed um, four letters of support for uh, different, but we, just rescinded. we just rescinded one, so it's four. Thank you. <laughs> letters of support for retail entities. Um, mm -hmm. We need to understand, do we want four retail entities in West Orange? That's why I asked, what was the process? Because they have state approval. Normally you get municipal, then state, and then come back to municipal. So I wanted to be clear on what that was going to look like. Um, but I think we do need to take a hard look at that. When we look at our neighboring uh, communities, they do not have most of them but one retail entity. Um, so I know we do have five. I'm, I'm, I'm writing For retail? No. no. Three retail. No, no. Three retail. Two cultivators. Two cultivators. Yeah, two okay, cultivators. I was forgetting one cultivator. Yeah. Okay. And, and but we only have two that have been approved from those five, mm -hmm. right? And right. and there's nothing to say that the state can't come back in December after they've reviewed everything that's been pending for them, that they may not approve any of the ones that we've recommended. That's a real possibility. Which is why I have a little bit of a concern about with the pause, but I understand um, that we'll get there when we get there. But I, I just have a, a challenge with knowing that we have all of these letters of support, knowing that we traditionally aren't going to have a tremendous amount of these businesses because our neighboring towns don't. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to, that's just not what West Orange is. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we just need, I just want to put on record that we need to really take a look at that. What's our process going to be once someone does get open, are we then going to say, okay, there's a business open, now let's stop and let's see. But again, if we're talking mm -hmm. about the investment that people have made, they're making an investment now to get here. Um, yeah. So I, I just think that's something we've got to take into consideration. We've had a lot of conversation about not communicating what you think should be communicated. Well, at this point, we need to understand of these entities, how many do we want retail establishments in our community. Mm -hmm. So that, that would obviously require the council to make that decision and then amend the ordinance because our ordinance has, you know, four licenses. And while um, New Jersey Library is now going to do the conversion application, if approved by the state, they take one license from the ordinance because then they're annual, they're no longer. Mm -hmm. um, but the other ones, who knows if they're going to, if but, that's the plan. You're and talking that's, about that's, the micro business and that's, that that's, there's no Again, the that's, that's the point. I mean, even if we're giving letters of support 
to three or four micro businesses? Do we want three or four micro businesses open in West Orange? That's still well, retail. Well, so the conversations that the task force has had, and, and they've been intentional about making sure that we're not clustering them, right? So um, the ones that we're talking about um, would be in different corners of West Orange so that they're not competitive with one another um, and they can be successful. I don't think that we should have more than what we have now. Now, I've always said if we had four cultivators and no retail, I'd be happy because it just produces more revenue for us, but that's not where we are. But we, and we know that's not where we are yeah. because we have letters of support for more than one retail entity. So, you know, is it going to be whoever gets open first? And then we're going to be like, okay, we're done. We just need to, we just need that messaging needs to be clear. I think the temperament and the mood of this body needs to be transparent because otherwise we're going to land back where we have been debating today. So because the council has approved the, the five letters of support, the resolutions of support, is, is it your expectation that when they come back that we may not support them? I mean, it's possible. It's possible. It's possible, depending on, you know, that second round of questions and the applications, whether or not we approve what their entire total business and, concept And is. then my next question would be, since we're having these candid conversations and we realize on November 8th there is an election and there will be a new um you know, administration, administration and, council. and council, then how can we affirm that it will be a task force for them to even come back to? Well, I think because January is right around the corner, it would be in the township's best interest to create a task force or repopulate, reconstitute the task force um, to continue the process for those that we've already supported. I just think those are things that we have to consider and talk about. Well, obviously, we don't have a clear plan because it is an election, but I think those are just topics that, as a council, we just need to think about because, again, Absolutely. it's the messaging. It's, it's what are we putting out there. So as far as the task force is concerned, what they've supported, obviously, is what they f the number they feel that is viable here in town. Um, what the council has said is four. So, um, yes, we have five. Don't know where they're, they are in there, uh, except for two, Peace of Mind, which is the cultivator, and West Orange Wellness, which is the retail dispensary. Those are the only two that we have approved so far. Um, the other cultivator, Yorkana, is applying or has applied. Um, New Jersey Library, let's see what, what happens when they come back. Dogwood, the last um, contact I had with the state was that they were still pending. They had some cure, and who knows, they, whatever it is that the state is looking for them to cure, they may, may not, yeah. yeah may not so, but I, I think that the council did speak when they said four, so I'm, that's why I'm certainly happy to support the, the resolution for a moratorium. It's what the task force also recommended. Um, but I don't see entertaining any additional ones except for the two that we have that are pending. Because again... But we had someone come to council meeting, at the last council meeting, saying that they were putting forth an application. So that's why I was not supportive of moving up the deadline. Because if they have come before us, I think we owe it to them to see. We just don't know um, what business until we see it. Yeah, I agree. It's going to benefit the community most. So... But anyway, I just that I wanted to put that out there for for um, just on record and certainly food for thought. Thank you. So so I, I will say I I think that is a part of the communication piece. Um, but for the one that did come and say that they wanted to apply, I think it was last meeting or maybe the meeting before. Um, I think it's important to tighten the timeline because if they're going to make a significant investment, I'd rather them figure out another space if they don't have enough time to do it here. Um, so that's why I, I would support, you know, we, we are asking these guys to make a tremendous sacrifice. Um, so I think we should be sensitive to that. And I believe they were micro-business retail, so. Yeah. 
All right, are we done with uh, new business? Uh, I believe so. Um, then I move to close um, consent agenda and move into the ABC hearing. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Night, Matt. Thank you. Good night, Good night, Good night, Good night all.